Thank you. I'll call the meeting to order. Thank you. So, uh, I declare the meeting open to the public online, and I would like to welcome members who are participating by telephone conferencing today to allow us to maintain the social distancing requirements within the chamber. And today, those members are Orlea Flynn, Pam Cameron, and Pat Sheehan. Can I remind all members about the protocols regarding the use of electronic devices? Um, we have full attendance today, so no apologies. Uh, no apologies received or relevant. In terms of chairperson's business, throughout the week I did a number of interviews. Um, those were done basically as, as a Sinn Féin representative, but they were introduced, or one of them anyway was introduced as chair, despite being advised of, of the fact that it was as a Sinn Féin member, but I sought to make that clear. Um, I did a very interesting meeting with one of our uh, the, the Rural Women's Network during the week, and it actually flagged up a number of concerns around mental health issues which they are fighting coming back very strongly from their members and they have a very extensive network of members but it also highlighted for me maybe the need for to try to find some way of engaging with more groups and i think when we come back i would like to maybe see if we can discuss a way that we can facilitate more meetings or with outreach groups in a way that doesn't overly sort of place on, over over overboarding them in terms of pressure but also gives them an opportunity to inform us of the situation that they're facing um we've we've had a number of, and, and maybe we can do some of that via starly for using some of the technology to mean, allow people to not have to travel or whatever but i think that's something we should look into um during the summer recess also the the i want to just let members know that it's normal practice for committees to delegate authority to the chairperson and deputy chairperson during periods of recess to submit views on the releasing or withholding of information in any non-routine or contentious freedom of information requests. In the previous mandate, the committee agreed to this delegation of authority and that the committee would be advised at the first available meeting following the recess period of any such requests and the views expressed by the chairperson and or deputy chairperson, as well as the response issued by the FOA unit. Are members content that we continue with that practice? Yeah, thank you. And just a final, a final piece of um, chair's business in relation to the announcement by the minister yesterday of the consultation into the soft organ donation. And one of the very first meetings, actually, that Pam and I did as chair and deputy chair was with the Donate for Dahi and, and the, the McGowan family and that Donate for Dahi campaign. And um, I just want to acknowledge the work of them and the work indeed of, of everyone who has brought that, that soft and kept that organ donation. We have some of the worst rates here in terms of right across Europe in terms of organ donation. So I just want to, I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure Dahi isn't an avid follower of the committee, but I, I, I believe he is following it this morning. I just want to say to him, Dahi, my who, Uber Intak, or Shin. And to wish Dahi McGowan and his family all the very best uh, in, the, in the time ahead, but just to acknowledge their, their work in that regard. So, Shine, I could say, Gore and Nish. Um, so, moving on then, members, to the draft minutes. Item 3, I refer members to the draft minutes of the pack held on the 9th of June, which are tab 3.1 of the meeting pack. Are members content with those minutes? Yeah. Um, matters arising, as agreed under item 9, a subsection 6 of the minutes, a draft letter was issued for agreement by email regarding the RQIA resignations. Can I check if members are content for that to be issued as contained? Yes. Uh, yes. Sir, I would have some issues. I thought we maybe would have been discussing it later in the meeting. Is it in correspondence or, or should in, we? In the draft letter, I have just some. Yeah. some we, we, okay, we can discuss that then during correspondence. Okay. Okay, thank you for that. Um, so we are now moving on to our substantive briefing, our first substantive briefing of what is a full day's business. Um, so in terms of our COVID-19 disease response, we have asked for a briefing from chief executives of various trusts. We have heard from some of the trusts previously, and we are hoping hearing from some more of them now this morning. I refer members to tab five of the meeting pack and tab five of the table papers. Can I advise members that the Chief Executive Officers from the three Trusts that we have not heard from are here today via video link to brief the Committee on the restarting of services and on budget issues? So I'd like to now welcome Ms Jennifer Walsh, Chief Executive of the Northern Trust. Are you there, Jennifer? Okay, I'm going to move on to Mr Seamus McGoran, Interim Chief Executive of the South Eastern Trust. Are you there, Seamus? 
Good morning, Seamus. And do we have Dr. Anne Kilyarong, Chief Executive of the Western Trust? Okay, Anne, thank you. You're both a bit faint there, but hopefully we can get that issue addressed and get the volumes up. But welcome both. And I'm going to go back to check. Is Miss Jennifer Walsh, Welsh, Chief Executive of the Northern Trust online? I don't think... She might have muted her mic. Jennifer, you might have your microphone on mute, possibly. No. Okay, I'm just checking, checking again. Jennifer, do we have Miss Jennifer Walsh, Welsh on the line there with us now? We don't have. I think we'll move on with the, with the other members and, and hopefully then we can pick up on it. Yeah, we are seeing a screenshot here where Jennifer is there, but Jennifer, you wouldn't have your phone on mute by any chance? No, I wonder can we make contact with Jennifer? Yeah, so someone will phone Jennifer and see can we get her on the line. And what we will then do is instead of that, we'll we'll uh, we'll go across to the other members of the panel just in order there. So, uh, Mr. Seamus McGoran is interim chief executive of South Eastern Trust. Seamus, would you go ahead and brief the meeting, please? Uh, happy to do so, and I do hope you can hear me clearly right. enough. Um, Sorry, Seamus, just give me. Just give me a second, Seamus. The volume is extremely low. We're going to try and get that, that improved. Um, it's clear enough, but it's very, very low. It's, it's, it's barely audible, so I don't think we can, we can continue to get it improved a little. Okay. That That's seems better, better now. I'm, I'm also going to just check again. Do we have Jennifer Welsh? No, not yet. Anne, can you uh, just check with us there on what your yeah. volume is like? Can you... Uh, yes, yes, Chair. This is Anne Kilgallen. Can you hear me clearly? Yes, that's that's good. That's that's nice and clear there. Okay, great, great. Yep. Thank, Thank you. you. So I'll go back to you, Seamus, then, and hopefully we've got you improved. Okay. Uh, have enough with the, the volume now, then, Chair? Yes. It's better. Yes, not brilliant, but it's better. Okay. Well, I I'll, I'll speak up as loudly as I possibly can. Um, good morning, all. Um, and uh, I, I think. Most people would recognise that the COVID-19 pandemic has been the biggest health and social care challenge that we have ever faced. Um, so from the outset, I would just like to pay tribute to our incredible staff for their commitment, professionalism, courage and excellence over the past four months. Uh, in addition to that, I'd also like to highlight their flexibility and can-do attitude, which has been critical as we, uh, as we had to move very quickly to reshape our services. Uh, to ensure that our public was protected and cared for during these unprecedented times. But I'd also like to say a huge thank you to our public, whose contribution to fighting the pandemic has been enormous. Uh, as we watched our, our television screens back in March, particularly pictures from Northern Italy and New York, many of us were hugely concerned within the service about what we were going to face. They're continually wondering whether plans that we had made be sufficient to ensure that everyone who needed a critical care bed or a hospital bed would get one. Uh, continually worrying whether our plans to support the vulnerable in our care homes would be sufficient to protect as many clients uh, as possible. Thankfully, our plan, the actions of our public, staying at home, following social distancing, practicing good hand hygiene, were the difference between Northern Ireland having a similar experience to Northern Italy and New York, uh, and thus actually being able to treat everyone who needed treatment. Sadly, many and it will be a little their loved ones, that generally Northern Ireland viewed as having managed the initial surge very well. Are you still okay? Are you still able to hear me okay, Chair? Yes. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it's still not perfect, but um, if you can just keep it as slow and as, clear, as loud as possible, Seamus, thank you. Okay. It is important to remember that the actions that uh, we had to take to manage this pandemic have not been without impact. Um, and we've seen reduced services across all programmes of care, people having to travel greater distances for care, increased waiting lists, potential for people to come to harm as a result of extended waits. A huge impact on our staff who've had to work longer hours, take on new or additional roles, 
and work on the front line in the knowledge that their risk of infection was greater than the risk faced by the rest of the population. They are exhausted. They do need their break. Uh, and we're extremely grateful to their uh, efforts. There have been many positives, however, from the past four months, not least the learning that has come from the need to work differently as we rebuild our services. And it will be absolutely critical that we learn from those and apply that for improvement into the future. In respect of rebuilding services, uh, in many ways, this is a significantly greater challenge than the initial challenge of consolidating services to fight the pandemic. COVID-19 is still with us and we need to increase our service provision whilst continuing to safely manage everyone who comes into our care. This is particularly difficult for emergency services where effectively we have to have separate pathways for suspect COVID patients and all other patients. As we rebuild services, like other trusts, we have to ensure equity of access, minimise the transmission of COVID-19 and protect our most uh, urgent services. Most importantly, we have to protect the public and our staff. This involves assessing the risk of service being considered within our rebuilding approach, including the ability to achieve social distancing, making adjust adjustments to our physical environment, staff availability, which is a massive issue, uh, personal protective equipment, among many other things. As part of this process, we recognise the importance of engaging with our staff, trade union colleagues, service users and political representatives. We also recognise the huge challenge of trying to quickly get many of our services back up and running while still having to manage services in the context of the pandemic. Reconciling the demand for services and reduced capacity is perhaps our greatest challenge. And for example, even if we had all of our staff available to any particular service, and that team did not have to treat COVID patients, capacity will most likely be reduced by 50% or at best 30% due to social distancing, safe use of PPE, and a number of other factors. So COVID-19 is having a huge impact on productivity at a time when we need to actually increase our capacity. Uh, in this opening address, I do not intend to uh, go into each of our services, as you will have, you will have the, the plans in front of you. But I do appreciate the concerns of our community that some of our services that we've had to temporarily cease may not be reinstated. I would like to realize that within our phase two plans, we have already switched on a number of those services and we are actively working on dates for recommencing others, likely to be after the period covering this phase. I will do my best to address questions about the service specific issues that committee members might have. Briefly on the financial position, um, I, I, I suppose I should start by saying every year we face an even greater financial challenge than the one before. Uh, since 2007, we've had to deliver savings year on year. All the low hanging fruit has gone. Uh, by and large, our recurrent savings are, are largely confined to pharmacy savings and some other small schemes. And getting su substantial savings within the system is proving extremely difficult without huge transformation. But we're working with the department of Health and the Health and Social Care Board to finalise the financial plan for 2021. Uh, achieving financial savings in the context of the ongoing pandemic will be even more challenging than usual. Uh, and in addition, COVID-19 brings substantial additional costs for service delivery. Uh, and I've broken those down. Uh, our expected additional costs this year will be £55 million, £27 million for PPE, £12 million for additional workforce costs, including overtime on social hours, enhanced rates, etc. £3.7 million in terms of grants and support to the independent sector, uh, and £3 million in infrastructure costs, including oxygen testing centres and lots of estates work. It's also important to point out that we do not yet have a three-year budget, uh, rolling budgets in place, and therefore effectively managing finances year on year proves extremely difficult, particularly in respect of delivering savings. The past four months have been the most challenging times that we have ever faced. Uh, thankfully, our incredible staff have stepped up to the mark and will continue to do so in the months ahead. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Seamus. Um, I just want to check then, do we have Jennifer Welsh on the phone? Okay, still not hearing from Jennifer. So, Anne, I'm going to come across now to you. Uh, could you go ahead, Anne, and brief the committee, please? Uh, thank you. 
Thank you, Chair. So to start, I would like to echo Seamus's opening remarks in terms of the performance and commitment of our staff and the support and behaviour of the public. Um, you'll be aware the Minister for Health published the strategic framework for rebuilding HSE services in June. As part of this, we trusts were requested to publish a stage one plan covering the period to the 30th of June 2020, setting out the early steps to plan for and increase capacity locally and across the system. Following this, in line with the approach outlined in the framework document, where we, to develop incremental service activity plans and targets in three monthly cycles, a stage two plan covering the period the 1st of July to the 30th of September 2020 was published on the 10th of July, and my briefing is based uh, largely on that. The Stage 2 plan provides a high-level overview of actions taken by the Trust in June and describes the services that we plan to maintain and rebuild dur during July, August and September. The overarching principles under planning the planning work apply to all of us uh, as Trusts and they are ensuring equity of access for the treatment of patients across Northern Ireland, minimising the transition of COVID-19 and protecting the most urgent services. In developing our plans, we have worked closely with our service leads to understand what can be safely stood up over this three-month period, taking into account social distancing, infection control requirements, personal protective equipment, staff availability, and importantly, the need to, pr to provide the opportunity for our staff to take leave. We are committed to ensuring that as we develop and move forward to implement our plans, they are screened for both equality and rurality to identify any potential adverse impact. Our Stage 2 rebuild plan set out the plans for July to September under the following headings. Firstly, hospital services. And these service areas include critical and unscheduled care, inpatient and day case services, outpatient services, diagnostic services, cancer and screening services, for example. A second broad area is community services. And this section refers to increased provision of allied health professional services, phased recommencement of our domiciliary care packages that were paused, phased recommencement of statutory daycare across older people's physical and learning disability and mental health programmes, stepping up our outpatient mental health services and psychological therapies, stepping up children's services, ASD, disability and mental health, and family and childcare services, including looked after children, fostering adoption and early years services. Uh, the third section then refers to corporate services, and they, uh, in, in that section you will find reference to our Pathfinder project in Fermanagh West Tyrone, to our approach to visiting, to our management and provision of PPE, our testing services for staff and patients, and the provision of continued support for vulnerable people in our communities, and ensuring that capital works to maintain our infrastructure are, uh, are progressed. In terms of measuring our improvement, uh, working with the Health and Social Care Board, planned activity volumes have been identified against a set of key service areas. This planned activity represents our best estimate of the volume of additional services we will be able to deliver in Phase 2, and you'll have heard Seamus refer to this in his opening remarks. It is complex to predict at a detailed level and will be subject to change, for example, when more accommodation and more staff become available to us, or if demand changes, both of which will mean that we have to respond differently. We're measuring uh, the, the increase in capacity against a baseline position of April 2020, when a high level of our planned services were significantly impacted by our response to the management of COVID-19, and we do anticipate an improving position. We do, however, recognise the need for our staff to rest and take leave when they were unable to take, which they were unable to take during the surge period, and that's reflected in the projections that we've made, and indeed in the initial pace of, re of rebuild. The planned activity is based on the following assumptions: that there is no second surge prior to the end of September, that shielding guidance is paused from the end of July, 
Um, the implementation of the plan will be informed by learning and feedback, and we make adjustments as we go forward. Um, we are dependent on adequate availability and quality of supplies, and in particular of PPE, that sufficient financial resources available. Uh, the important issue of childcare, that staff are supported to attend work and, and that they do have adequate access to childcare, including uh, that school restart plans go ahead and that current protocols for testing staff and patients will continue into the future. Finally, just to talk about key challenges and constraints, um, you'll hear us say, uh, and you will not be surprised, that rebuilding our services is proving to be complex and requires a large number of risks and issues to be factored into decision-making. There are many moving parts. To support the rebuild process, the Department of Health had issued a checklist and we are assessing all our plans against this before and during implementation. So the key challenges and constraints include the current social distancing guidelines and the impact this is having on physical space, including our ability to maintain separation of patient flows, and Seamus referenced this, separating people who are suspected to have COVID from those who are not. So maintaining that separation and social distancing within our existing estate and also accommodating services that were relocated or indeed stood up during COVID-19. Supply chain for critical items, including medicines and blood products, as well as availability and quality of PPE. The latest public health and infection prevention and control guidance. Being sufficiently flexible to enable an effective ongoing response to COVID-19, while recognising the importance of rebuilding planned services for prioritised clinical groups on an equal basis for the population. The importance of good communication with our staff, our trades unions and the public on our plans for rebuilding services, being mindful of our commitment to co-production, engagement and informed involvement in key decision making. Ensuring any rebuild plans focus on, focus on minimising the risk of uh, spread of COVID-19 infection, particularly amongst patients, service users and staff, recognising the need for staff to rest after the first wave. Staff availability, and I, I'm repeating myself here, but staff av availability as leave is being encouraged to ensure adequate rest. Plans will also be constrained due to the level of staff vacancies across the trust, and staff vacancies are a particular challenge uh, to us in the West. Ensuring staff support continues to be available in terms of any increase in psychological and occupational health-related matters and anticipated ongoing additional costs to support the infrastructure adaptations that we need to undertake as a consequence of maintaining social distancing, equipment and ICT costs to support remote working, and then any necessary increased staffing, all of which will be subject to securing approval. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Anne, for that presentation. And I'm uh, checking again, do we have Jennifer Welsh on the phone there? Jennifer, are you with us? No. Can I, can I comment? Go ahead, Seamus. Uh, I have been in contact with She is trying to telephone. She's trying to telephone. Okay, well, uh, what I think is we should move on to maybe some questions, and then when we get Jennifer in, we can, uh, we can come back to her and ask for her briefing. But we'll go ahead with members with uh, members' questions for now. So, I suppose in relation to um, concerns have been raised with the committee over a number of sessions that decisions could be made now under pressure in a way that doesn't realise the full potential of co the co-production model. And I'm conscious that within the strategic framework approach, uh, it states that work streams are clinically led where appropriate and are proceeding to develop proposals in line with co-production principles as far as possible. Now, I suppose that doesn't inspire much confidence in terms of the value that's being placed on co-production. And I would like to know, could you give me a sense, or the committee, a sense of your approach and how you'll ensure that decisions are informed by effective engagement? Yep. Yeah, go ahead. Would you like me? Yep. So, um, uh, as with all the other countries, we have uh, a range of, of methods to actually ensure effective engagement and co-production with our service users um, and virtually all of our services have some form of 
focus group, engagement group. We take our uh, public and personal involvement responsibilities uh, very seriously. Uh, and, and quite frankly, whilst we have all of the uh, health and social care expertise in terms of service provision, uh, that lived experience that the patient and client have uh, is so full of knowledge and informs our thinking, our planning, our service delivery. So the principles of co-production, they haven't changed. The, the, the challenges of, of actually uh, getting engagement with some of our service users, some of whom are quite vulnerable, are having to shield, for example, um, are a little bit more uh, difficult. But we, we, we do continue to engage. We're, we're not planning to make any substantial changes um, in a, on a long-term basis uh, over the coming months. And indeed, um, most of our changes will always be aimed at, a, at improvement. So we, we continue to have a level of engagement. It is absolutely not to the extent that it would have been pre-COVID, um, but we're, we're, we're trying to build that up in the same way as we're rebuilding our services. Okay, and Anne, can you give us some information as, as to how you are approaching that in the Western Trust? So, in, in general, as Seamus has said, we have arrangements in place for personal and public involvement, and we, we obviously continue to use those existing arrangements. But there are a number of additional arrangements that we have in place at the moment. So, uh, for those uh, populations whom we know well, so carers and people with very specific needs that are, would normally rely on us from care, we are in regular contact with them about our services and about standing up our services and are informing and involving them to the extent that we can. So we are maintaining close contact with people who are normally in receipt of service, services from us where we have changed or stood down those services temporarily. We also, as you will know, have uh, regular briefings with our MLAs and our MPs and with our council members and we're very alert and alive to feedback from our public representatives in terms of broader issues across the communities. Um, Pathfinder is a very important vehicle for us. We have kept Pathfinder going. That's a, a particular um, uh, co-production uh, development that we have in Fermanagh West. Ron and you, Chair, will be familiar with it. And we have continued to, for, groups have continued to meet by uh, remote video conferencing. And again, we've had feedback, particularly from carers during that process. That's been an opportunity for us to be in constant dialogue with uh, key groups in our communities. And then finally, I would say in relation to some of the newer developments, so very specifically the virtual working that we've introduced large numbers, of, particularly of people who are needing review, that's, been, that's happening by remote either video conferencing or telephone contact. And we do have very specific um, processes to get feedback about the experience of those services, which will influence what we do going forward. So um, I, I hope that's sufficiently comprehensive. We, we've, in summary, our relationships with people who rely on us from care, we've kept those alive, we've kept contact with people, and I would like to believe that we are both informing and listening to what works for them in terms of identifying what we can mobilise to support them. And more specifically then, through co-production, we already have existing arrangements. We have Pathfinder, which is particularly important to us. And in terms of feedback, we've both the evaluation of new forms of working and also our, our regular engagement with MP, MPs, MLAs and our local councils. So it's not perfect, um, but it is a means for us to get very real feedback. And as Seamus has, has said, it is not our intention to make any significant changes to our services um, that would that would uh, normally require consultation without having um, without following due process. Okay, thank thank you for that. And I do acknowledge what you're saying there in relation to the PPA and the, the personal involvement. Um, and the efforts that you are making, and, and that's welcome. I suppose there would be um, a view within the committee that co-production actually even goes wider than that, in the sense of a full range of allied health professionals being involved in designing and, and setting up the services, and also um, unions and staff representatives via the unions, that those types of organisations would also be part of the co-production process. Um, so. so yeah, go ahead. Can I comment on that? Yes. I didn't. Mean, yes, I, I'm sure Seamus will speak to. We have weekly meetings with our trades unions representatives, 
and um, we, we talk to them about any temporary changes that we're making. And when I speak about our, our staff, I mean all of our, our multidisciplinary, um, it is a multidisciplinary approach. And in fact, uh, much of the change in virtual working um, involves our allied health professionals uh, to the to the fore in that. So um, I'd give you reassurance on both those points. And I'm, I'm sure Seamus will, will say similarly. Uh, absolutely. And uh, like our colleagues in the Western Trust and all Trust, all of our clinical staff and professions uh, are very much shaping how we deliver the service. Thankfully, uh, we, we don't have to rely on chief executives to know what's best in health and social care. We have lots of experts out there and we tap into that expertise on a day and daily basis. In respect of our trade union colleagues, right back at the pandemic, we put in place a, a structure with an oversight group. Uh, separate work streams to take forward our, our, our work. Trade union uh, representatives set on all of our work streams as appropriate and have been fully engaged with us on a weekly basis and on a daily basis as required. Okay, thank you. My other question then or concern I suppose to, to explore with you is around the staffing issue which you have both mentioned there. Um, I know that there's currently I think in the region of a 10 to 15 percent absence rate and I recall at the, at the time of the pandemic when this was all starting off one of the one of the worst case scenarios was around a 20 percent absence rate so i'm struck by how close we are to that at the current time and how how vulnerable the services are to any any shifts in that um, i also note that um there are a number a large part of those are down to mental health issues which is hugely concerning but could you could you give us some indication as to how you're how you're uh, trying to deal with that staffing issue in terms of staff retention staff support and recruitment or whatever other initiatives are in, 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 in train at present? So will I, will I start, Chair? Yeah. Go ahead, um, Anne, please. Yes, thank you. So, so just in, in relation to the West, we have a, an absence rate at the moment of about 12%. So it, it is improving slightly. And you're right, we, we didn't actually face the worst case scenario of 20%, but indeed we're, we're, um, we're in, in the realms of it. I, I would accept that. So 8% of that, of that 12%, 8%, uh, it, sorry, 8% of our staff are off because of sickness. And the most common reason is, and that's about 16% of those are off as mental health. So we're particularly concerned about that. The other 4% then relates to shielding and risk assessment of staff where it is not appropriate for them to be in the workplace and they can't be otherwise deployed. So, so that's that's the, the uh, context. Um, we have worked both regionally and locally in terms of developing support systems for our staff because it was absolutely clear at an early stage that our staff were as vulnerable as the general public and indeed more so to uh, practical concerns and anxieties as well as their underlying physical conditions and, and potential ex exposure to the virus in the workplace. So from a from a uh, perspective, a physical perspective, all of our staff were risk. We have a risk assessment process, and all of our staff who are in vulnerable groups will have had been offered that risk assessment, and and then arrangements put in place where necessary to support them. So we have been proactive in terms of identifying where we could potential at risk uh, staff and providing the, the support for them. More broadly, then, in terms of supporting staff concerns and anxieties in the workplace, we've had a mixture of we've had a psychological uh, support line which has been well used. We've had occupational health uh, helpline, and we've also had general, uh, both uh, through internet and through telephone, general queries. So for people who are just seeking information where, where they haven't been able to achieve that from any other source. We've organised uh, from a management perspective to ensure that all of our managers are appropriately briefed, that they can signpost staff to support whether it's occupational health or more general advice. Um, and that they understand the uh, intent of the organisation. We developed a framework document focusing particularly on psychological safety for staff and again supporting our managers so that they feel um, able and ready to, um, to, to, to be there for staff and to handle and, and respond appropriately to their concerns and anxieties. Um, just now we have uh, uh, designated two of our psychology staff 
who are developing um, a training programme which will be added to our existing training for managers, which again is about absolutely ensuring that uh, at every level in the organisation, managers are able to respond, um, signpost staff and indeed escalate concerns where that's necessary. So we've had a comprehensive programme. We have been guided by the region um, and but but we're absolutely certain that supporting our staff is the key to rebuilding our services. So I think um, I've covered most bases in that, and Seamus will want to add from his perspective. I, I've very little to add, and as you well know, um, we've taken a regional approach to our staff and wellbeing, to issuing uh, policy guidance, uh, and the system has been working as one, probably more than it ever has over the the past four months. So. All of the actions that our colleagues in the West are taking, we're equally taking in, in the South Eastern Trust, and the other trusts will be the same. Uh, I suppose the only specifics I want to mention, but again, we're very similar. We've, we've a split of, of, of around eight uh, percent in our, our staff sickness generally, which is which is an increase uh, on on our normal levels, and about four percent of our staff are shielding, so they're not available to us. So overall, absence is about twelve percent. Um, as I say, the regional approach is, is something that we've taken not just for for staff well-being, but in respect of how we address many challenges over COVID and our rebuilding plans also uh, are, are taken forward on a regional perspective. Um, the final comment I would say is that the health and well-being is one of the biggest priorities for the, uh, the, the management board for rebuilding services um, because we, uh, and Anne has actually led or is leading a piece of work to take the learning from COVID uh, and the innovation that has been put in place by our staff over the past four months so that we can build on that, maximise it uh, and spread it across the region as best we can. Uh, and two priorities immediately emerging from that work that Anne's leading uh, are how we best use virtual platforms in order to um, consult uh, and assess our patients and clients across the, the region. But the, the second one is a very specific focused piece of work about the health, the health and well-being of our staff. Uh, and that is one of the biggest priorities that we're we're taking forward as a management board. Okay. Thank you for that. And the final one from me then before we go to members is around the PPE. And I know, Anne, in a previous briefing, that document that you had supplied to representatives, you highlighted that PPE was one of the one of the main potential concerns around the ability to rebuild services. I also know that there's a particular difficulty within the system around those FFP3 masks. So can I ask you, on the FFP3 masks, what is the difficulty with, with, with sourcing those? How bad is that situation? And in relation to PPE more generally, are you satisfied that that issue is being addressed in a way which will not provide a barrier to services? So go to Anne maybe first with that one. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So um, the PPE situation has stabilised, Chair. And there is, uh, at the moment, um, a, st a predictable supply of PPE across all modalities. Um, the issue in relation to the F, so that is at the present time. Now, I would never be complacent about that. I, I'm, I want to be guarded in what I say, in that we have to uh, mind, uh, we have to use wisely the PPE supply that we have. But we do currently have a, a, a predictable supply. And that's partly due to careful use as much as it is to uh, to the flow uh, the supply side. Um, they, with regard to the face masks, um, the issue there is one of bringing in new masks, and this is of necessity where where a new type of mask is introduced. The need to test and retest re staff. This it's called face fit testing, um, and and that's. Uh, a pinch point for us insofar as we do we're we're aware that there is further supply required but at the moment our supply is stable but there is the issue that as the face mask changes uh, there is a need for further uh, face fit testing for staff and that is time consuming and it also requires us to use some of the masks so that's why the ffp3 masks are a particular uh, a, um, a particular area of PPE that we are we pay close attention to. Okay, thank you. And Seamus? Yeah, just really to add to Anne's comments um, um, uh, in respect of rebuilding services, obviously um, we use uh, incredible amounts of PPE 
um, it could be 10 or 12 times or even 20 times what we would normally use for, for masks or gloves, aprons or, or other uh, protective equipment. So um, the supply line was challenging in the early weeks, as Anna said. It's very stable now. We have a good predictive level of supply. We can't be complacent. But as we rebuild our services and engage more with our patients and clients, invariably we need more masks. So we have to ensure that the rebuilding is in line with the supply chain for PPE as well. And that's a, that's a, a delicate balancing act, but so far so good. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And I believe we now have Jennifer on audio link. So I'll maybe introduce Jennifer now and let her do her presentation there before I go back to members' questions. Jennifer, can you hear us okay? Yes, I can indeed, Chair, and my sincere apologies that I'm only able to join you now. Yes, no, no, no problem. I'll thank you for joining us and, um, and, and just acknowledge, I believe, yesterday, as of yesterday, you're now the, uh, the, the, you had been interim, but you're now fully in post, so just to, just to acknowledge that. Do you want to go ahead then, Jennifer, and brief the meeting? The other two chief executives have done so, so would you like to go ahead and brief the meeting on the issues within your trust area? I will indeed, Chair, and I would imagine I'm probably repeating a lot of the things that my colleagues Seamus and Anne have already said. Um, the priorities for us have been about ensuring equity of access, uh, minimising the transmission of COVID-19 and obviously protecting the most urgent services as, as well. And apologies if I'm repeating things that have already been said. Um, a major part of this is about ensuring that safe working environment and the planned safe restart around all of our services. And I've just heard you talking about PPE supply and so on um, as well. And again, the availability and flexibility of workforce across the seven-day service, and I caught a little bit on, on absence as well. Um, I think um, rather than going into a lot of the detail, which has probably been repeated before, and, and you may have covered some of the areas around new ways of working, which I think has been incredibly successful throughout the course of the pandemic, particularly around virtual clinics, group se sessions, changes in pathways, particularly working across boundaries with primary care colleagues in a way that perhaps has not been done before. So there's a lot of good things to have come out of this as well and the level of collaboration across trusts with partners, minimising all boundaries and really trying to optimise uh, patient care um, as well. So I, I think, Chair, I, I will just pause there because I'm, I'm sure I'm repeating the same things that colleagues have said. I'm more than happy to take any questions that, that you might have. But like others, we, um, we were able to maintain a number of services, uh, particularly in and around our cancer surgery and, uh, and things like that, where we have moved services across different sites to try and maintain them. Um, we had a slow start in June. We've been able to ramp up a little bit more in, in July and slowly, slowly getting back up to speed. Okay, thank you for that. So I'll go across now to members' questions. I'm going to go first to Alex, then Paula. I'll then, I'll then go to Pat and Arlea on the phone and then back into the room to Jerry, Alan and Colin. So could you go ahead, Alex, please? Thank you, Chair. Um, of, of three quick questions, hopefully. Um, they're mostly aimed at Seamus, <laughs> if that's okay. Um, you mentioned about capacity. We're talking about outpatient appointments and, and day procedures and stuff like that. Um, they could be reduced down as much as 50%, if I, if I read that rightly. So there's obviously some sort of savings there, which obviously we would like to be using, if we could, fully for outpatients and stuff. Where's that money going to go towards um, that's not going so to be used? Uh, we have enough savings to achieve this year. Uh, and where there are costs we're not incurring, for example, um, we, we, we're not incurring the same costs in respect of disposables and consumables. Um, we are, if we're operating on fewer um, patients, then the costs uh, are, are, are less. But you have to remember that the substantial costs that we have within health and social care are on our staffing. It'll be around uh, potentially up to upwards of 80 percent of all of our costs. Uh, we, we will continue to incur all of those costs. And in fact, we're, we're paying additional hours and enhancements to a number of our staff. So um, the savings aren't, aren't uh, uh, that significant, um, but, but they will be part of the, uh, the savings that we are, are going to have to deliver within this year. And in some ways, they are a, a coincidental byproduct of not seeing as many patients, um, but at least it means that we're not having to search elsewhere to find savings. Um, to try and make up for the capacity issue, which is severely dented and, and obviously a deep concern because waiting lists are, are crazy as it is, um, are you looking about 
are you looking at th such things as maybe doing more clinics into the evenings to try and make up that, um, maybe the weekend, and, and also outside providers as well? So, yeah, yeah we, we, we have started doing some of that. Um, it, it's, it's small numbers at this moment in time, but that is helping towards us closing the gap. Uh, we, it will take several months, um, and who knows, it might take until we actually have a vaccine before we could get back fully up and running at normal levels. And that is a major concern for all of us, because as you say, the waiting lists have already been uh, lengthy in the past, uh, pre-COVID, uh, and they're now creeping up um, uh, as we would have expected because of our reduced capacity. So we're, we're probably operating at around about 55% of our outpatient capacity, um, but we're actually making really good strides, as Jennifer has alluded to, in respect of virtual consultations. Um, and in fact, we're trying to reorganize our services in such a way that um, when a patient is actually seen by a clinician, all of their tests and results um, might be available to the, the clinician so that they can make a much more informed decision. So I, th th there's, a, there's a, a long way to go. We are rebuilding. We are doing some additional evenings and weekends. That is, that is taking out some of the savings that we have made in respect of consumables. But I think it's, it's difficult to ask staff to do lots of extra work some staff are prepared to do that, but they've had an exhausting four months. They need their break, and we need to be very sensitive to trying to get a balance between building our services and giving our staff the break they need. Um, a point you may mentioned, which was interesting, was about a three-year ruling budget. How important would that be going forward to the future that you could have a three-year ruling budget for all the trusts? Would that help your planning considerably? And it, it absolutely would. And I think I think the, the problem is when you're operating on a 12 month basis and, and let's be frank, you know, we're in July and there's still a little bit of uncertainty around what exactly the, the full allocation is going to be uh, for, for the year ahead. But So there's a wee bit of work to be done on that front and COVID complicates it. But if you can operate on a three year cycle and you know you can deliver substantial change, transformation is required within our system and can redistribute our resources in a more cost-effective way. Um, but doing that within a 12-month operating cycle is becoming almost impossible because of the huge challenges, the need for public consultation, the need to, to plan and effectively make change is difficult to do within a one-year cycle. But if you know that you could carry an overspend from one year into the next or the next and know that you can recover that overspend in that time, you can make much better decisions, you can plan much more effectively, uh, and you can actually deliver change in a meaningful way. Yeah. Um, just the last quick question, just to put you all on the spot. Um, car parking charges had been suspended for staff during the COVID-19 crisis, and we're still in it. Um, and I understand that those charges are going to start again for staff. Could I ask you now, is it possible for that to be suspended for another period, um, as it was very helpful for staff, um, and I think it's a wee bit too soon to be asking staff to be paying for car park charges again during this crisis, and it's not something that you probably know I'm in favour of anyway. So could I put you all under the spotlight now and ask you not to be charging the staff for car parking charges? Thank you. Okay, I mean, it's a fair question. It's something we've wrestled with considerably, but I suppose I have to go back to the previous question you asked around uh, the financial situation. So um, we incur uh, significant costs in order to have a traffic management system in place, and that's barrier management. It's about staff. It's about um, uh, security cameras, security staff. It's about actually looking after our car parks because we don't get any funding for those things uh, out of the health and social care budget. Um, therefore, we introduced uh, car park charging to the public and staff on the back of a departmental directive, which came out some years ago. So whilst um, we were delighted, the minister made a decision to stand down uh, car parking charges up to the 31st of Mar uh, July. Um, and I have no doubt that, that our staff found that particularly beneficial. Um, we're not in a position to actually continue that beyond the 31st of July mainly for two reasons. One is financial, because that then adds a financial burden. We don't have a source of income to address that. 
Uh, but secondly, actually, our car parks are now becoming quite difficult uh, to manage, uh, given the rebuilding of services. More and more people are coming onto our sites. We've had the changes in the visiting policies. So actually, as part of our traffic management system, we made a decision that we would have to reinstate charging from the 1st of August. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, I'm going then to members, and I'll go next to Paula. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much for the presentations this morning. Um, I think, Seamus, it was in your remarks you talked about assessing the risks, and I just wonder if you could give us your um, thoughts on the introduction of face masks for people attending um, outpatient appointments, attending hospitals, care settings, given how vulnerable so many of them will be in terms of age and underlying health conditions. So just wondering if you've, if you've got some thoughts in terms of rebuilding and, re and then introducing face masks. So uh, uh, the Chief Medical Officer is on record as supporting uh, the wearing of face coverings for those who come on to uh, our uh, facility, be they health care or where appropriate, uh, other facilities, hospitals and other facilities. So the CMO is on record as, as clearly stating that support. Um, uh, that, that is something that, you know, if you look around the world uh, and, and the, the number of countries now where face coverings are becoming mandatory, it's, it's mandatory here, but um, we, we expect all of our uh, our visitors uh, and our uh, and those who are coming in to receive care to be wearing face coverings. Um, that it, they're not not the sort of face mask that we would wear, our staff would wear in a clinical situation. Face coverings, because there is good science now that says those who are wearing face coverings are restricting or minimising the ability to pass on any infection that they might have to other members in, in close proximity. So uh, interestingly, we as chief executive have also been talking this week about how we actually uh, uh, put in place um, a, a, a policy and guidance around our own staff um, who, we all, obviously staff who are working on the clinical areas are, do, are wearing those face masks as appropriate, but we're now also looking at where our staff also should be wearing those in wider public areas. I say public, public within our hospitals, for example. So the face coverings, um, have been on their way, and I think they will continue to do so. There's good scientific evidence to say they help re re reduce the spread of infection. Um, I think it's entirely appropriate for, for all of those visiting our premises to wear face coverings, and we're now looking at extending uh, the areas where, where they should be wearing them as well. Just before the next um, lady comes in, just do, do you think you could be moving to the point where they're almost mandatory for visitors? I think that was probably the, the point I was making, but if if any of the others would like to respond on that point. Well, my, the, the difference between mandatory and encouraging people to do so uh, is the, the is enforcement, effectively. Uh, or, so how do, how do we enforce the mandatory wearing? And the best way to do that is, is to probably make legislation around that. So uh, within health and social care, yes, we, we, we can make something mandatory. How you enforce it becomes a, 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 a challenge. But if, if, if mandatory is the way to go, we'd be more than happy with that. But certainly, that's the direction of travel we've been on anyway. Okay. And do we have comment from any of the other, from Anne or, or Jennifer? So Anne here, just to confirm that um, I, Seamus is describing how we are as a system. We do expect visitors to our sites to wear face coverings. Um, uh, again, uh, we don't have a, a re an enforcement regime as such, but we do expect we recognise there's a small number of people who can't tolerate face masks, but in general, or sorry, face coverings. But we do expect people who come onto our sites to wear face coverings because there is an emerging evidence about the value of that. Okay. And Chair, just to add to that, it's Jennifer here. Um, and in doing so, because we have that expectation of members of the public coming in to avail of any of our services or indeed to visit others, um, then I think it's, it is also appropriate that our staff um, wear face coverings of some description in non-clinical areas as well, such as corridors and so on. Okay, and my second question then relates to this morning the emergency care waiting time statistics were released and for April to June. You may not have seen them yet, but they're obviously down, de decreased from last year. That's the sort of coming through the lockdown. But I'm just wondering, um, in terms of rebuilding urgent and emergency care, what opportunities do you see really in terms of some of the lessons learned and, and in terms of rebuilding those? Is there anything that you can be doing that actually will keep the, the um, numbers of people attending down so that you can actually be dealing with the most urgent cases? 
Thank Chair, you. it's Jennifer here. I'm happy to take yeah. that. Go ahead, Jennifer. Thank you. Um, I think that's an extremely good question. I think there have been some, there's been some excellent work throughout the course of the pandemic, particularly working across different traditional boundaries. So I think there has been great work across primary care with GPs, GP out of our service, the COVID centres, then direct access services uh, into our hospitals, program treatment units. So a whole range of things before you actually get to the stage of an emergency department. And that's really the kind of pathway reform that we're wanting to look at trying to look along a continuum of care for a patient along a patient journey uh, and it's exactly as you've just described Paula in relation to trying to make sure that only the sickest people those who really need to go to our emergency department do so and that we're providing alternative pathways alternative ways of being seen and supported rather than simply going to an emergency department okay thank you thank you thank you so going across now to the phone there checking pat can you hear us and, and can you give us your question there please i can indeed can you hear me chair yep loud and clear pat thank you okay thanks uh, i just wanted to go back on to the issue of uh, ppe and particularly the ffp3 uh, face masks and over thirty-seven thousand uh, fit test and certificates have been reviewed in almost 3,000 staff have been identified as needing a retest. Can the three chief executives tell us how many staff in each of their trusts have been affected and if any of them have contracted uh, COVID-19? Thanks. Thank you. So, yeah. um, yeah. It's we'll Anne here. We'll Anne. Shall... Go ahead, Anne. We'll Sorry. Anne first and then Jennifer and then Seamus. Yes, so I don't have the precise figures in front of me, but approximately 500 staff were affected in my organisation um, and uh, required a retest, um, and there was no instance um, of infection. Okay. Have I answered that completely? I'll yes, you. thank you. Are you happy with that, Pat, from, from Anne? Yes. Yeah. Yes, yes. The same question to Jennifer. Yes, again, quite fortunate in the Northern Trust, a smaller number, I think, I can't remember off the top of my head, but I think it was around 200 or fewer staff that needed to be retested. And to the best of my knowledge, um, no one had contracted COVID-19. And Seamus, then, on that issue? Yeah, so there were 94 staff who, uh, whose test certificate... Sorry, sorry she um, just, just missed at the crucial point of re -cut out. Can you say that again? So 464... We're affected. Uh, virtually all of those have been retested for uh, an alternative mask and are, are, are working uh, with that mask. Um, out of that number, actually, we had 14 staff who had contracted COVID-19. Um, one, one of the, the, the challenges for us is to try and understand no. uh, to what extent related to the wearing of masks in the workplace uh, or whether it was in respect of something else. We're, we're taking the view that, uh, we, that we have to make assumptions that it could well have been in respect of, of their failed mask. So we're working with staff. Um, they've all had support from their managers, from occupational health, from psychology services. Uh, staff are very happy and, and uh, those who have, they've contracted the uh, COVID-19 uh, have recovered and are, are back at work. Okay, Pat, back to you. Have you a second question? Okay, th 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 thanks for that. And, and just uh, staying on the issue of PPE, uh, I think it was on, uh, you said that the supply of PPE is stable at the moment and protective. However, we're being lobbied by uh, a, a, a large number of dentists who are telling us that they are having... Uh, a great difficulty in accessing the PPE that they need for AGPs. And I'm just wondering, would you like to comment on that? Um, I, I, I can't comment, Pat. Uh, the, I, you, you're talking about independent uh, dentists and they would have supply routes which would be different from ours. I, I don't, that's not in any sense to, to distance myself from the problems that they've identified. Um, all I can speak for is the, is the supply chain for my own organisation. And it, it is predictable in a way that it definitely was, you know, was, was more, it was more unstable in March. It's predictable now. And um, we also are more certain about what, what we need 
so I, I, I really can't comment on uh, what the dentists are experiencing um, with that, and I don't mean that in any sense to diminish uh, uh, the concerns they're expressing but they don't apply um, at the moment to, uh, the work, to my workers and, and my work environment. Okay, thanks for that. And I suppose the reason I'm raising it is because there has been a lot of talk that there may be a, a spike uh, sometime after September. And I'm just wondering, are all the chief executives confident that there will be enough PPE at that particular time to deal with whatever surge comes in terms of COVID-19? Thanks. Yeah, well, I we'll think I... I think it's, it's, it is very difficult to actually look forward and understand when we would have a further surge and what that further surge might look like. I think if you were looking at the Southern Hemisphere countries, uh, there is a very high prevalence in, in some of those countries now, and that's because it's the middle of their winter. So we would expect that any surge coming across the winter perhaps could be more challenging than the one we've just gone through. So it's difficult to actually say, as the world is competing with PPE, whether we will have the same level of confidence at that stage. All I would say is, as our, our reliance on PPE has grown, the supply of PPE has substantially grown as well. Uh, and I think there's still time to rebuild our emergency stockpile ahead of the next surge. And the management board, uh, one of the biggest uh, issues we deal with in the management board as well is planning for the next surge. So I can assure you that all of the work that needs to be done in respect of capacity, staffing and PPE has been actively being taken forward right now in the event of the, uh, another surge. But if I'm being optimistic, I would hope that outbreaks here and there can be contained and managed and that we might not get a second surge, but we're planning for the worst case scenario and PPE will be a big part of that. Thank you, Seamus. And then Jennifer, in relation to looking ahead preparation for second storage and, and supply of PPE. Yes, thank you, Chair. I think Seamus has covered a lot of it. The only thing that I would, would add is in relation to the supply chain and creating more of a, a buffer for all of the services here. And the Business Services Organisation is working really hard to try and create a supply of 12 weeks. So there, there's an inherent buffer that we can look ahead in terms of what we think might be coming and tweak and tune our services according to the supply that we actually have there. But just to echo again what Seamus has said, the, as our demand demand for PPE has gone up, so too has the, has the supply coming in and being available to us. So we're in a significantly better place than we were four months ago. Thank you. And Anne, please. And, but, and, and just take the opportunity to say that uh, prevention and control of infection is just absolutely crucial. And the more that we can work together to ensure that people are not complacent, that they continue to observe social distancing in particular, hand washing and the use of face coverings in crowded places. I, I think that, that just remains so central to all of the messaging that we need to, we need to continue to broadcast to people. Um, we can't afford to let the, the infection run away from us. It is all about prevention and control of what we can. So I, I, I'm a very strong advocate for paying attention, continuing to pay attention to, to prevention and control of spread. Okay, but in relation to uh, the, your, your view of the supply coming into September, you think that that will be manageable? It, 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 it is predictable at the moment. I, I don't think any of us can be complacent about the potential for another surge, but the, it, the supply chain has improved. It, has, it is predictable. And as, um, as Jennifer said, uh, working towards a 12-week buffer is the key in all of this, and BSO is working hard to achieve that. Thank you, Anne. Okay, going there now on the phone again to Orlea. Orlea, are you there? And can, do you have a question for this section? Yep. Can you hear me? Okay. I can, Orlea. Thank you. Yep. Brilliant. Um, so thanks very much, Seamus, um, Anne and Jennifer, for um, your presentation so far. I just want to touch on um, it's a bit more um, specific around the, the refades and all the services, some of the issues that have been brought to my attention and I'm sure to the other MLAs also. Um, but in relation to... Sorry, we've lost you there, Orlea. Orlea, we've lost your audio. We've lost your audio. No. 
Or Leah, we've lost your audio. Lost it a lot. Each sound to start with. Yeah, it was actually quite good, the sound. What I'll do is I'll come back, I'll come back to our Leah, possibly, if we can, if we can make okay. contact. Our Leah, can you hear me there? Yeah. Okay, listen, members, I'm going to suspend for five minutes just to see can we address that technical problem. Oh, so we'll suspend for five minutes. <laughs>
Uh, so I apologise that I don't have the date to hand, um, but I would I would emphasise the fact that we have continued to provide urgent services, although not inpatient. And then in relation to deaths, like Seamus, I'm not aware of uh, deaths related to COVID in any of our mental health units. Um, but I say that without actually having a, done an authoritative search, but I'm, I'm really not aware that we've had any. Okay, thank you, Anne. And Jennifer, anything on that, on that issue, on any of those issues, please? Yes, just briefly to add in relation to uh, maternity services and the service in Causeway. The majority of maternity services, as in the antenatal and postnatal natal care, remained in Causeway. We used the inpatient ob uh, obstetric service, moved it from Causeway to Antrim for the period of the pandemic. We have not been able to move it back as yet, and that's entirely related to, to staffing. Um, and it's at a, a medical middle grade rota perspective. And there are a number of individuals, um, one of whom is shielding, one of whom has gone back to their to their home country, another person also ill. So we have not been able to safely restaff the service currently. We hope to be in a position to do so towards the end of August. So it is our intention to get that service uh, back to Causeway. Uh, then in relation to the addiction. Can you hear me, Jennifer? We're, we're not hearing you in the room here at the present time. Uh, Orlea, can you hear me still? Uh, they're all gone again, sir. I send pig pigeons to. <laughs> um, okay, we're going to have to pause again there to see can we get the line re-established. We're going to pause the meeting again just for another minute or two. Senate Chamber, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. Okay, we're we're back we're back into we're back in public session and we were just we were with yourself there, Jennifer. Yes, that's right. We had heard yeah. Uh, we would heard the most of your your answer there, but you were you were still um, in, you'd said you'd indicated that you were hopeful of setting up one of the services back by the end of August, and that's I think where we lost you. Oh right, okay, yes, that was that was a return of the um, obstetric inpatient service to Causeway by the end of August. We're hopeful of doing that, and certainly it's, an, it's our intention to get that service back um, there as soon as we have the safe staffing rotas to be able to do that. Um, the second part of my response then was in relation to the addiction services and particularly around inpatients and um, it had been our plan and, and I will check but the ward should be reopened now. The intention was to get it going by Monday of this week. Um, it's normally a 10 bedded ward and our plan at this stage is to operate at a reduced capacity of five beds and that's to allow us the, the social distancing requirements um, that, that we now require. And then the third element was in relation to the adult mental health in patient services and we, we were aware of challenges in England and we took the decision within the organisation at an early stage that whenever guidance was coming out to us in terms of infection prevention and control for our acute inpatient wards such as at Antrim and Causeway and elsewhere we decided to apply the same guidance to our mental health and patient services as well. Okay, thank you. Going across now to Jerry. Thanks, Chair. Hopefully you don't cut out with uh, Hopefully. one of the, my questions, but thanks, uh, Chair and everybody. Um, a couple of quick uh, questions. Um, staff have obviously been recognised for the important work they've done throughout the current period, and, and Seamus uh, referred to it. Uh, however, the fact that um, healthcare workers are still waiting on uh, lost pay from taking strike action uh, in earlier this year is very, very concerning. Uh, would the Chief Executives agree with me that it's uh, time that those workers were paid uh, what they're what they're owed, and I, I would also share uh, Alex's concerns about um, car parking charges uh, as well. Uh, I, I'm a bit concerned that um, 
in two of the documents that we were presented uh, before this uh, meeting that there is a reference to return to urgent services. I mean, obviously, urgent services need to be available for people, uh, but I'm concerned that there's maybe a bit of a language being used to emphasise urgent services and maybe other services either don't come back, come back or come back at a later stage. Um, and there is a particular concern. I mean, I know there's no um, uh, Kathy Jack here. I'm due to meet her next week. But there's a concern in particular around the Matter Hospital uh, in uh, Belfast, North Belfast, about services maybe not returning um, after um, after COVID. Uh, so could the chief executives give uh, us an assurance that all services that existed uh, before uh, COVID-19 uh, that were in place will will uh, return? Because there is a, a real concern out there that uh, the pandemic could be an opportunity for, for some people to try and restructure, uh, to um, you know, cut up and, and possibly privatise aspects of our NHS. So those are my questions. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. Go across to the panel then. I'll go to maybe Anne first, then Jennifer, then Seamus. Um, so the, the focus on the word urgent is because we have reduced capacity and we have to prioritise the return of services. So uh, it's the same people who deliver the service, whether it's emer generally speaking, whether it's emergency, urgent or routine, but it is a matter of prioritising the cases and the people who are seen. And that's, uh, that's difficult. Um, that's a challenge that we face even in normal times, but it's particularly, um, it's particularly important now. So the, there, there's no, in uh, no intention uh, in using that word urgent other than to say, that we have got to prioritise who we see and we need to see the people who are most likely to benefit from the service now. Um, our int my intention as a, as a trust chief executive, and I, 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 all of the chief executives will say the same, our intention is to, is to gradually build back up our service capacity. How those services are delivered I think in some respects will change. So, for example, a lot more will be delivered virtually than before. Providing that's a safe because we will continue for the foreseeable future to have to observe social distancing and infection control. So for that reason, I think we will continue to use virtual means to deliver services. But for all of us, our intention is to rebuild services um, uh, safely. And the use of the word urgent is about priority. Uh, uh, no, nothing, nothing more than that. Um, it's just making sure that this, that we get the, we, we attend to those who are most likely to benefit uh, first. Um, I, I, so I, I think have, have I answered you fully, Jerry? Yeah, on that point. Thank, thank you, Anne. Go across now then to Jennifer on the same issue in your trust, Jennifer. Yes, I would echo what Anne had said in relation to the to the return to urgent services. It is about scaling back up again and taking a risk stratification approach um, to the people that we need to see most urgently and, and then right through to, to our routine services. But it is our intention to get all our services back running again. And again, to echo what Anne has said, I think there's been a huge amount of really good work done in relation to, for example, virtual clinics and group sessions. That's not suitable for everybody. We, we are very mindful that not everybody would have access to the technology that would allow them to attend a virtual clinic. So we, we're, we're mindful of where we cannot do that and it's not, and it's not appropriate. Um, it, it also in relation to a first outpatient assessment, sometimes those people do need to be seen face to face. Um, and But then you can maybe move to a virtual session uh, beyond that. So it, it's with the intention of getting things back up and running, albeit maybe running in slightly different way where that's appropriate to do so. Okay, thank you. And Seamus? Yeah, just, just to repeat our, our full commitment and our intention to reinstate our all of our services um, when the, the time is uh, right, when it's safe and appropriate to do so. Um, we're gradually rebuilding and we're, we're getting more optimistic about what we can do in the months ahead. Um, I don't think there's much more I need to add about the, the fantastic work that's been done and how we deliver services um, might look a little bit differently than and we, we uh, in terms of the way we actually uh, provided services previously, uh, and it will be a blended approach of face-to-face of -face and virtual. And in fact, so many of the people who've gone through the virtual consultation process, we've had a lot of feedback, uh, and most people actually prefer not to join a, a long queue for the car park uh, and to be, to be seen in the comfort of their own home by a, a high-quality virtual link. Um, 
just the, the one question that, that, that needs to be picked up on the strike, on strike pay. Uh, the Minister uh, made his commitment to reinstate strike pay. Just quite simply, we haven't had a direction yet uh, for that to happen through salaries and wages. Um, I'm sure it will happen in due course. But uh, more, more than happy for us to, to proceed on that basis. Okay, thank you. Going then to Alan. Uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, just uh, again, just to place on record uh, my appreciation for the efforts of everybody involved in the NHS and, and social care during these very difficult times. Um, I appreciate that preparing for the pandemic must have been a huge challenge for everybody involved in, in the trusts. Uh, and I assume that winding down and, and returning to normal services may actually present as big a challenge, uh, particularly when we have to be mindful uh, of the possibility of uh, another surge. But um, in terms of returning uh, to services, um, are we talking about returning to the pre-pandemic way of doing things, or do the uh, uh, contributors feel uh, that this might be uh, an opportune time uh, to recommence uh, a conversation uh, around starting to deploy some of the Bengoa recommendations. And in terms of um, physical uh, logistical changes that have been made in trust premises, uh, I presume that they all will be retained in case of a second surge. In relation to telephone consultations, um, and I was a uh, subject of, of one of those myself uh, recently, um, do, I, I can understand the benefits uh, both to the patient uh, and uh, to, the cl to the clinic uh, of being able to do it over the telephone, but do the medical experts, are they totally confident that they can protect patient safety in the same way as they can in, in a face-to-face in -face consultation and where they can actually physically examine uh, the patient uh, in the consultation. And for Seamus, just to go back to Alex's point about car parking, uh, Seamus has made a, a, a very good case for, you know, that, that well, the, half, the trust has to recover its operating costs, and that's perfectly understandable. But could I ask, is there a, a profit Markup uh, in what staff pay for uh, for the uh, the car parking, or does the, the amount of money that they pay purely cover uh, the justifiable operating costs, as, a, as opposed to making a profit? Thank you. So we'll we'll start with Seamus then, and then go to Jennifer, and then Anne. Okay. Um, I, I think it's a, a really good question about to what extent can we. Um, learn from our experience over the past four months and actually improve and transform our services. Um, but there's a delicate balance that has to be had because obviously if, if, we, if we're if we suggesting making changes which have a substantial impact on where our higher service is delivered, then um, we have a clear obligation to consult, engage and, and follow due process if we're going to make some of those uh, transformational changes. So, so many of the changes Bengoa talked about will fall under that category. But many of those changes also, transformation isn't just about where, how we, uh, where we deliver services, it's much about how we deliver those services. And, and we, we've talked enough about the benefits uh, of, of the virtual platform and, and, and rolling on to that issue. I, I, it's, I, it's absolutely correct that uh, many patients will require a face-to-face -face consultation have the opportunity to have a physical examination, albeit that percentage is not as high as you might think. Some of the important work that has to be done before a clinician can, can make a really good diagnosis is around the diagnostics. So what we've been doing and better at doing is getting some of our diagnostics lined up ahead of some of those virtual consultations so that the, the, the actual consultation itself can be meaningful, effective, and a greater chance of having a clear diagnosis. So yes, lots of patients still will need to be seen face to face. Very often, when it is a first time uh, appointment, as Jennifer has said, but also there's there, there's been some fantastic innovative work done to actually expedite uh, our diagnostics. We see examples of 
drive-through services. Um, there's much closer working between primary care and secondary care, and we need to build on that because sometimes patients end up in a, a secondary care and on a secondary care waiting list and perhaps maybe don't need to be there if we could get upstream earlier uh, and have better management and support to primary care then there's a good chance uh, some of those patients won't need to actually be seen within secondary care so lots lots of opportunities to transform our services some of which will be in line with bengoa but where where it's very clear and the, and the minister has, has put this on the record where there's a substantial change that requires consultation, we will be doing consultation. So I think it's important to emphasize that. In respect to car parking, our car parking charges reflect our costs, actually. So there, there, there's, there really is a covering off uh, in terms of our, our income and our expenditure. Thank you. Thank you. And Jennifer and Anne, Jennifer first then, if there's anything in particular, in addition to Seamus, and then we'll go to Anne. Yes, yeah, just the, the only thing that I would add additionally is that obviously during the course of pandemic, we've all had to create new services as well. So we've had to create new staff testing services, ramp up our laboratory capacity and the ability for those to, to take swabs and so on as well. We've also had to t create a new testing service for um, healthcare workers within care homes and support that broader community as well. So there are new services that we've had to create that we will also have to keep going. Okay. Thank you. And Anne, anything additional on that? To create these new services, and we're now trying to get the balance between those um, those two things. So that's the only other thing, uh, Chair, that I would want to add over and above what Seamus has already said. Thank you, Jennifer. And Anne, on that on that question there, Anne? Uh, I, 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 I couldn't add anything to what's already been said, other than just to confirm that virtual uh, consultation isn't the answer to everything, but used in the right way, it's made a huge difference to how we've coped. And I think it will continue to make a difference to us into the future because it's so much more immediate, in particular if you've got the diagnostics. It can be delivered in the home to the individual. Um, so there are a lot of factors needed for it to work well, but it certainly is a significant contributor or will be a significant contributor. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, I'm just checking, can the, can the panel members hear me still? Seamus, can you indicate if you can hear me there? Okay, we're going to pause again and hopefully get this session concluded, but we're going This is the Northern Ireland Assembly. We're going to try that now. So the final word on this session then to Colin. Oh, thank you very much indeed. Um, Chair, um, yes, there'll be no surprise to Seamus. I'm going to ask about the Down Hospital and when you're going to open the emergency department in it. But um, in your response that you'll give, I want um, all of the panel to discuss with me what inter discussions there are between you as chief executives about emergency department provision um, in the north because if we look at northern ireland we can roughly split it into three equal populations there's the population of down the population of antrim and the population of the rest of northern ireland and that's 550,000, 600,000, 650,000. So those three areas uh, have roughly the same population base. But during COVID, during the coronavirus period, County Down was left with one emergency department and it was located three miles from the border with County Antrim. And County Antrim had four emergency departments and the rest of Northern Ireland had three. Why was County Down and the population of County Down robbed of its emergency provision? And what part did you play in your discussions in being complicit to that? Yeah, Seamus. And so, Seamus, then we'll touch with, with Anne and then Jennifer. Yes, Seamus? Okay. So, so we do actually uh, regularly communicate, um, as I say, twice a week at this moment in time. Prior to COVID, it was once a fortnight. Um, there, there is a review of ur urgent and emergency care that has been ongoing for probably uh, 12 to 18 months. Uh, and that group has actually been looking at how best to deliver urgent and emergency care across Northern Ireland in normal times. I think if you go back to where we were in March, um, as I said at, uh, in my opening address, we were looking at the, the screens 
in the in the TV screens around Northern Italy and New York. Even one hospital in London running out of critical care capacity um, in by about the third week in March, uh, we were faced with having to reshape our services very quickly to respond to the pandemic. Uh, we are five separate uh, healthcare organisations. Um, we did communicate with each other at the time, but we also had uh, a responsibility as an individual employer for our own governance, for our own services. So we made a decision to consolidate our resources in a way that meant we, we decided to um, temporarily close the ED in the Down Hospital uh, and also our day surgery and endoscopy services there, uh, relocate our patient staff within the hospital, but transfer some of those key staff up to the Ulster Hospital to be the, the major centre for the Southeastern Trust area. So I, I, I hear what you're saying about planning from a Northern Ireland perspective. Um, uh, at that time, from a governance perspective, from an, uh, an operational perspective, uh, we all had our own individual um, decisions that we had to make. Um, but uh, but we, we, we have been conscious about the, the impact of that in the South Down area particularly, and certainly ourselves in Southern Trust have been in, in closer communication since then about how we can switch back on services. Okay. Yeah, and, and uh, the, the other, um, go to Jennifer then, in relation to that question. Yes, I suppose, I mean, I would simply echo what, what Seamus had said. Um, I think Trust Chief Executives are working incredibly well together now. We're, we're in much more and um, more frequent and closer interaction than we had been prior to the, the COVID pandemic period. I think at the early planning stages, we were all tasked with looking at the requirements for our own populations, and therefore we've all had to make the, the decisions that, that we did in relation to our own operational services and what was going to work, work best uh, for our various populations population basis. Um, I think there's a new opportunity going forward and potentially heading into, into a, second, uh, a second surge. Um, I, I suppose that's all really, Chair, that I would want to add at, uh, at this point. Thank you. And Anne, finally on that point. Yes. Um, yes, from, from my perspective, I would say that during COVID, um, my focus would have been on ensuring that flow on my, in, in my emergency departments was safe. So, in other words, being clear about the protection of people who are suspected to have COVID and people presenting with non-COVID conditions. So, very much a focus on local operations. Um, and, and now we're very much concerned with ensuring that pathways are available to people to provide much more care upstream to try to avoid the use of emergency departments as a default and we have an opportunity I think to understand better how we can support particular risk groups in the community and how we can fine tune pathways. So particularly for us the regional group sharing learning about safety in the emergency department and pathways uh, which anticipate care is, uh, is an immediate priority. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, I suppose it's a little bit worrying to have heard maybe at least two of the respondents there say that they had to investigate their own areas and look at their own systems and look at their own places and that effectively County Down was left with very, very little emergency cover. We had a number of occasions where the ambulance service actually contacted elected representatives in County Down to say that they weren't able to provide an ambulance service. So the population of County Down was left at times without an ambulance service and we had one emergency department that was three miles from Belfast. Uh, that is just not good enough uh, and that needs to be lifted up. And same as I see you indicating, I know from the figures that they may be a little bit old, but 53% of the throughput of the emergency department at a time in the Ulster came from East Belfast. That's not servicing the people of Down uh, and that needs to be addressed. But you did refer to the review, the urgent review, review of urgent uh, and emergency departments. There was a suggestion in the, in the newspaper a couple of weeks ago that there would be five hospitals that would be ambulance only and the rest of the emergency departments would be urgent care sectors. Are you actively preparing for that? Are, are your departments, are, are your trusts investigating being able to deliver that as a service? Or are you just as shocked as the rest of us uh, and just reading about that within the newspaper? Go ahead, Seamus. So, um, just going back to the point about the Down ED specifically, and that, that's the department which is in my area of responsibility. If, if you go back to what our planning was at that time, 
as I say, we had lots of, of images uh, and, and very clear uh, reports from the, in the media about how hospitals were overwhelmed with COVID. Um, patients actually on trolleys outside hospitals, clinicians having to make decisions about how they would actually um, admit a patient into the last critical care bed that they had when there was a demand for maybe five patients. So the, the, the importance of a critical care unit largely dictated our thinking in respect of how we deployed our resources at that time. So the Down Hospital um, is, has a level two emergency department. It's, it's, a, it's a, a cooperative of, of emergency and urgent care staffed across the ED, nurse led minor injuries and our GP out of our service across the 24 seven bases. There's no capacity for critical care, uh, emergency surgery, um, very, very acute uh, medical patients. It, 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 it has a certain infrastructure that allows it to support many patients, particularly those who are older patients. It does a fantastic service to our frail patients, to those who have um, long-term conditions which are exacerbated at, at any time. But also, um, it, 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 the, the biggest issue was it just doesn't have a critical care department. And therefore, it could not serve as an acute provider within the pandemic. So um, when you bring it to the next stage and, and, and look at how you deploy your staff across wards and through the emergency department, it's very clear that we needed an emergency department that would have two separate streams, one for COVID patients and one for non-COVID patients, separate pathways. And that actually means having to consolidate your resources um, to actually meet the needs of those who uh, were going to be coming our way from the pandemic. Uh, we've had to effectively go from three emergency departments in the Southeastern Trust to virtually four because two streams in, in the Ulster and two streams in the Lagan Valley. So that was the thinking behind our decision making. Uh, and it's really important to emphasize that um, we, we, we have to remember where we were when we made those decisions. Uh, in respect of how we move forward and the report you said, and I, and I take all the points that you've been made, but every reason that you've given for the down not being able to stay open is, is similar for the Lagan Valley, but you maintained the Lagan Valley because it doesn't have access to all of those uh, services that you said as well. So there was a decision obviously taken at a point that then it's either the Lagan Valley or the down. The down didn't get the service, but the um, unit that's eight miles by motorway from several other uh, emergency departments and is also in County Antrim, uh, was chosen over the unit that's in County Down. And again, I ask the question, why were the people of County Down left isolated without emergency care? So, uh, our rationale has been from the start that we would gradually draw in our resources if we needed to increase our critical care capacity and our, our acute capacity for those who were most ill. So when it was obvious, so, so the next decision we would have gone to would have been around Lagan Valley. But we didn't need to go there because the pandemic and the surge was not as great as had originally been feared, partly because of the plans we put in place, but also because of the response of our public around staying at home, social distancing and, and good hand hygiene. But, but Lagan Valley has more than double the number of uh, uh, hospital beds that Down has. And that is the, the only reason why we went to the Down rather than Lagan Valley. It was just around our overall capacity within the system. And I think it's really important to, to remind everyone that, um, uh, I think it's important to the staff in Down particularly, the Down Hospital played a critical role in our management of, of the pandemic. Um, it, a, a number of our COVID patients um, would have been redeployed back into, or, or repatriated back into the Down Hospital from the Down area, or even in from the, the, the Greater Lisburn area as well. Uh, and the, the, our, our team in the down did a fantastic job as part of our overall response. We have to make decisions about how best to deploy our resources. Uh, and those are very much based on our operational ability, not anything other than that. Okay. Okay. Thank you for that. And thank you to our panel for your presentations today and for the responses you have given. And I'm sure members may want to follow up particular issues with you further. I have no I have no doubt about that. But for now I would like on behalf of the committee to thank okay. you for thank you for making your presentations. And um
I'm not sure if you can still hear me. I'll, I'll just continue. Thank you on behalf of, of the committee for your presentations. To wish you all the best in the time ahead and to acknowledge and wish all the best for your staff who are working on the front line. Thank you. And the meeting is now suspended for a short break to get our next. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. 
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. Okay, members, we're... Okay, thank you, Pam. Okay, we're back in, in public session then, members, and I am pleased to introduce our next session then in terms of our COVID-19 disease response is a briefing from the Chief Nursing Officer. I refer members to papers at tab six of the pack and table papers, which include the executive summary of the Nursing and Midwifery Task Force report, terms of reference for the Rapid Learning Initiative, and the Minister's response to issues raised by the Committee following its briefing session with the RCN. Can I advise members that the Chief Nursing Officer is here today via video link to brief the Committee on the experience of the nursing profession during the pandemic and other issues relating to the pandemic? So I would like to just initially, before we start the session, just declare my own interest as, as having been previously a social worker within one of the thrusts and being on, on a leave of absence or a career break from that, but also my wife is, is a nurse as well. So I just wanted to declare that before we start. And I would like now to go ahead, Charlotte, and invite you to brief our committee, please. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chairman, and thanks for the opportunity today to address the Health, Health Committee on, on COVID-related re uh, issues. I think we would all agree that um, the last few months, particularly since March, has been one of the most challenging for our health and social care service. But there's no doubt that during the, this unprecedented time period, um, nurses, midwives and allied health professions in Northern Ireland have stood up to the challenges in a very positive professional 
creative and solution focused way and every time that I've had the opportunity to be out uh, in the service during the, the, the COVID period, I'm completely overwhelmed by the, the, the way in which uh, nurses, midwives and allied health professionals have responded to COVID. Um, and as Chief Nursing Officer, I want to place on record my absolute admiration for a sterling service, professionalism and the resilience uh, shown by uh, our staff, all staff uh, in the health and social care service in the face of COVID, including uh, volunteers and also um, carers. Uh, specifically, nursing, midwifery and, and allied health professions were very proactive and responsive. And despite the workforce challenges uh, which they faced, the professions rallied uh, all of their efforts, their skills and their focus on making sure that trusts and care homes were prepared with a workforce ready and capable of providing an exemplary service to the people of Northern Ireland at a time of greatest need. Being true to the values of professional practice, they also rose to the, to the challenges with steadfast resolve, I have to say, and to deliver skilled, very compassionate care and that has undoubtedly saved many lives, not to take away from the fact that for those who lost their life, it was tragic and all lives lost are most regrettable. Throughout this period, the nursing and midwifery and allied health professional workforce developed innovative solutions to their practice and their services to effectively respond to the needs of the population and to ensure that their patients and clients and residents receive the very best safe and effective care possible. I really want to acknowledge, of course, the wider nursing, midwifery and allied health professional support teams, nursing assistants, maternity assistants and support workers from the allied health professional workforces who supported the professional staff in delivering that very skilled and high quality care. Their combined contribution has been nothing short of outstanding, in my opinion, um, in the collective fight for COVID-19. Some examples of that, allied health professionals were essential to the respiratory needs of patients, to the nutritional management of patients in critical care, and in supporting families and children with special education needs, providing resilience and support to care homes and to patients in their own homes and in continuing virtual and vital services during, during such a, a difficult time, stretching right across to pre-hospital paramedic care and delivering radiotherapy and, and uh, radiography services. As the largest professional group, nurses and midwives have the ability and the flexibility and the agility to transform how care is both organised, delivered and provided and played a pivotal role in the pandemic response. The nursing and midwifery contribution encompassed all programmes of care adults, children, mental health, learning disability services. The wide impact of nursing was demonstrated across all settings. For example, critical care nurses at the forefront of intensive care, district nursing services where workforce uh, work demand increased significantly uh, and who supported the most vulnerable in communities, many of whom were shielding. In many instances, the profession put the care and the well-being of the people of Northern Ireland ahead of their own personal needs their own personal families, and indeed many of them left the comfort of their own work environments and their own home uh, in order to provide that care and make sure that people were cared for. I also want to pay a particular tribute to the students. Uh, nursing and midwifery students are to be commended for their part in the pandemic and the response and the way in which they responded to, to the call for action. Um, I realised that students had many questions. It was very challenging for them. They had anxieties and they had fears but they came forward uh, to workplace, work, work placements um, and all of the allied health professional students finished their programmes early in order to be in practice and support the workforce and they made an absolutely amazing contribution. The feedback received from service has been extremely positive about their contribution at such a critical time and I think it's fair to say that the future of our professions, nursing, midwifery and allied health professions are definitely in safe hands in the response of our, of our students and in particular the final year students. Um, turning to the, the, Nightingale, the Nightingale Hospital, um, nurses and allied health professionals were instrumental in the opening of the Northern Ireland first, uh, Nightingale Hospital at the Belfast City Hospital site. The 230 bed facility was staffed by a team drawn from across Northern Ireland and to manage the anticipated surge of COVID-19 patients requiring intensive care. Um, when I visit, visited the, uh, the, the Nightingale Hospital with the Minister, it was very clear to me about the uh, key role which nursing in particular in this case paid in getting that uh, facility up and running within a week, uh, turning it around. Uh, ward sisters coming from other parts of the hospital to work in and lead intensive care teams, 
really stepped up to the challenge and, and a hugely important role to play. And it's testament to the work of the health and social care system and the combined response to COVID at the Nightingale Hospital was temporarily stood down again in May. But we shouldn't ever underestimate, I don't think, the emotional burden that has placed on staff in caring for very acutely ill patients and for dealing with patients when uh, in normal circumstances they would have very good, str strong family support, which wasn't available to them. Um, and and that, that, that has caused emotional um, burden, I suppose, for our staff, given the number of COVID deaths, which were so untimely and so regretful during the pandemic phase one. Turning then to partnership working with the independent sector, the impact of COVID-19 um, has been devastating for, for many residents and, and their families and their relatives, and, and of course, for the staff working in the care home sector. Based on their age and underlying conditions, many residents were, of course, at high risk from the effects of COVID-19. And in April, the Department of Health, in partnership with the independent sector, established uh, under, under the minister's request a rapid learning initiative to understand the impact of the interventions implemented within care homes to prevent the further transmission of COVID-19. That partnership approach has enabled joint learning to enable collective uh, action across the statutory and in the independent sector and to implement best practice and a plan for future COVID surge. I believe that the partnership that has been built uh, during this, this very rapid period will provide the foundations for collaboration in the development of a framework for enhanced clinical care within care homes across Northern Ireland, which again, the minister has asked me to take forward. During this pandemic period, uh, more so than ever, um, and at any other system, and as such, Northern Ireland must now seek to optimise potential that has been demonstrated within the profession to best effect. In turning then to, to rebuilding and moving forward, again, these groups, allied health professional nurses and midwives, have been critical to the aims of delivering together uh, and the roadmap for transformation of health and social care in Northern Ireland, working across many different clinical pathways. This will continue, and their leadership and their expertise provided by those professions of nursing, midwifery, and allied health professionals are essential to the rebuilding plan and to restructuring the HSC uh, post COVID 19. This will include strengthening community services, preventing hospital attendance and admission and supporting uh, discharge, transforming elective outpatient services and elective care in general, and, and establishing urgent care services going forward. There will be a new norm, and I don't think that our health and social care service will go back to uh, the way that it was. While it's crucial that we continue to adapt our service and to respond to the challenges posed by COVID, it is vital that uh, such the workforce we uh, continue to move forward. And as I'm sure you're aware, Minister Swan recently launched the Nursing and Midwifery Task Group report back in March, which sets out a roadmap to achieve world-class nursing and midwifery services in Northern Ireland for the next 10 to 15 years. This report will address the challenges faced by the workforce and it highlights how the contribution of nursing and midwifery could be maximised even further to improve health outcomes for our population. It outlines the ambitions and the commitments from the department uh, and the support and the implementation of key stri strategic priorities. Uh, just uh, to mention three main areas, stabilisation of the nursing and midwifery workforce and to ensure safe and effective care strengthening the role of nursing and midwifery and the role they play in population and public health planning, and thirdly, to enhance the role that nurses and midwives play within multidisciplinary teams as part of the wider transformation of our health service. COVID-19 will continue to present new challenges for all of us, for nursing, for midwifery and for AHPs. However, the invaluable response of this workforce to date has proven that these challenges are not insurmountable and has paid testament to the investment shown by the Department of Health to the long-term vision for these professions. The Nursing and Midwifery Task Group recommendations are now more crucial than ever, and I will be developing a Nursing and Midwifery strategy to take forward the, the implementation of the recommendations. So in closing, uh, Chair and Committee members, it is with great pride that I carry out my role as lead um, for Nursing, Midwifery and Allied Health Professionals. I believe I speak for all of us when I say that we will be forever grateful and appreciative of the contribution that was made during this exceptional time. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that, Chief Nursing Officer. And I suppose the first question from me, and you have mentioned or you've touched upon it there, is in relation to the allied health professionals. And we understand that your own role as Chief Nursing Officer is one that must have a heavy, heavy workload. But 
In, in light of that, are you confident that you will be able to fully represent the allied health professional perspectives on the new management structure? And in, in relation to that, can you advise how you intend to engage or how do you currently engage with those allied health, the chief allied health officer to seek her views in an appropriate and timely way so that their views are kind of hardwired into the process? How do you manage that? Um, yes, uh, Chair. Um, in response to that, I would say that the allied health professions have been part of my um, divisional structure here in the department for, for many years, actually, since I came in post. So this isn't a new a new development. And the chief allied health professional officer is a senior member of my team. We have regular meetings. We meet on a Monday uh, at, with the senior team. I meet with them. Um, and we have regular contact with her. I'm in daily communications with the chief allied health professional officer. And any uh, advice or information that I need to take forward to the management board will be provided by Jenny in, in, her, in her role. Should the management board require any specific and detailed information, which is allied health professional uh, specific, which requires a more detailed response, of course, the chief allied health professional officer will be invited to attend those meetings. Um, I, I'm actually leaving the committee today to chair um, the allied health professionals work, workforce steering group where we're bringing forward plans for each of the individual professions around workforce development and the needs of the undergraduates uh, across all those different 13 professions. So I'm very closely linked in with allied health professions, both through the chief allied health professional, but also uh, through my connection with the service. And you'll understand that the trust structure, each of the directors of nursing also has special responsibility for allied health professionals. So when we meet as a group, allied health professional issues are also uh, addressed. I'm very confident that going forward, I can I can hold that brief, and Jenny provides me with the necessary expertise to do so. Thank you. Um, moving on then to the rapid learning initiative, which you have also uh, touched on in in your remarks there, can you give us any information as to when you expect the task force to report? Yeah. So um, it is a rapid learning. So um, and because of the the, the the clues in the title, I suppose it was a very short piece of work. Um, I'm expecting to have the report at the end of July, uh, which will then, uh, obviously, with Minister's approval, move forward with the implementation of some of the recommendations. And um, the early feedback that I'm I'm getting is is that there are a number of operational uh, immediate things that could be implemented, and then there are more strategic uh, issues that will need to be addressed through other forums. And um, this has also been uh, raised with the uh, the management board. And, and it's uh, one of the key uh, strands of work is the development of the acute care at home model into uh, the care homes and uh, the development of the new framework for uh, the acuity uh, on the health needs of people in care homes. So it will link into into that work. Um, I think it's 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 fair to say that I've been very pleased with the response that I've had um, in, in relation to the call for people to be involved in the rapid learning initiative. A call went out to all nursing homes um, almost 500 of them across Northern Ireland, and there's been a very good response. In fact, I chaired two uh, Zoom calls with the independent sector, and while we had 90 direct um, individual links onto the calls, many of them were multiple people in the room, so I anticipate that potentially 150 people have had direct access to, uh, you know, for me to hear their views on, on the issues in, in the care homes. And they've had uh, two surveys issued. One is patient experience and staff experience, which went to the care homes, to the residents and their families, and also the staff. And the second then was a management uh, survey, which looked at things like the management of infection control, the management of people through care homes and, and reducing uh, footfall, and the management of PPE. And I expect that they will form the basis of many of the recommendations. I should also say that uh, the Rapid Learning Initiative is being supported by the Institute of Healthcare Improvement, IHI, um, and they, they're they saying that this is a fairly unique approach. There's very, very uh, little evidence from elsewhere of this approach being used uh, to in instigate rapid learning from the first phase of, of COVID uh, in order to be prepared for any further wave that we would have in the future. Okay, thank you for that, and, 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 and I appreciate you setting out there your engagement with the sector in that sense. However, could you also give us information on how you're engaging with other stakeholders, and in particular the, the trade unions, um, because the initiative was set up in April, yet in June, when we spoke to the, when the committee was, was presented to by the unions, they still weren't at that stage aware of the initiative. 
So how is the workforce being represented on the task force and how are you engaging with stakeholders and including and in particular unions? Um, so it, it, uh, there are four work streams um, under the Rapid Learning Initiative, one of which is actually chaired by uh, Brenda Rush, who's the Senior Professional Nursing Officer at the RCN, and she's also the network lead for care homes. So there's a direct link in there to, to the RCN and they've been fully engaged uh, to, to join. Unison were also invited to join, but declined and said that they would rather um, provide evidence through frontline staff, if you like. So the, 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 the frontline staff have been involved, as I say, in the initiatives directly. And the four subgroups are then supported by a steering group, which is made up of the independent sector itself, care home managers and frontline staff, but also uh, the Department of Health, the Public Health Agency, the Trust the Board, the Health and Social Care Board, RQIA, the Royal College of Nursing, the Patient Client Council and independent healthcare providers. Um, and, and going forward, I would intend to, with the uh, development of the plans for the, um, the new framework for healthcare needs in the care home sector, I would plan to widen that to include um, voluntary sector organisation representative voice of, of uh, people in care homes and I'm also uh, planning to uh, discuss the plans going forward with the Commissioner for Older People. Okay, thank you. And the final one from me then before I go to the phones, first of all, and then um, to members in the room. The final one for me then is on the strike pay reimbursement. And I see, I note from the Minister's letter that he references that he brought a paper before the Executive on the 2nd of June. But in response to my assembly question in relation to that matter, he, he stated, that was on the 26th of June, it states that the Minister will be bringing forward a paper to the Executive. So I'm wondering which it is, and more importantly, I suppose I'm wondering, when will the staff who were on that strike see the money into their accounts? Um, the Minister has given his commitment to reimbursement um, of, of the strike pay, and I understand his discussions are ongoing with the Executive about how that will be done. Um, this is not an area that I provide advice to the Minister on, so um, there's not much else I can say uh, in relation to that, Chair, other than that it's in progress and, and they understand that the Minister, ha the Minister has made his commitment to ensure that that happens. And, and I understand that the money has been committed from finance, so it seems strange that it hasn't happened. It's, it's, it's something that has come up a number of times at the committee, but in any case, thank you for that. And I will go across now to our Deputy Chair, Pam Cameron, who is joining us on the video link here, or certainly by phone. So, Pam, go ahead, please. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Charlotte, for your attendance at the committee today. Um, I do appreciate the um, the presentation that you that you've made, and um, I would like to actually hear maybe a wee bit more detail up around the Nightingale system, because obviously, um, should we have significant uh, spikes that could well come into operation again. I think it's 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 very useful for um, for us as members of the committee and even for the general public to, to know what it's actually like to be working in those ICU units in particular. Um, but Charlotte, I wanted to very specifically ask you around the staffing of units such as Nettingale and ICU units uh, in general, because uh, it is. Um, for a long time been a big concern of mine, the issue around the banding uh, and how, you know, staff are not feeling that they are being valued and that they're quite frankly not being paid what for the work that they're doing, for the job that they're doing. And we know what an incredible job that they have done and continue to do. So, so specifically, one of the recommendations of the nursing and midwifery Task force is to develop arrangements for accelerated pay progression in band five to band six grades to take account of the years of experience and additional responsibilities undertaken by band five nurses, which is particularly evident as, as I was saying during the pandemic. And I note the implementation plan says that the department will conduct a review to establish evidence of costs and benefits of full implementation of this recommendation. So I know the Royal College of uh, Nurses has experienced disappointment that the Minister hasn't accepted this recommendation. Can you tell us why this recommendation has not been accepted and is the review underway? And if so, when will that be completed? Okay, um, um, thank you for that. So uh, um, to start, I again want to say that all the contributions that nurses made, uh, both during the, 
the pandemic and, and prior to and going forward are absolutely valued by the Minister and the Department of Health and the Health and Social Care System. There's no question about that. And many of them have fed back to me their, um, their pleasure at the, the number and volume of um, gifts, applause, thank you notes that they received from the population in Northern Ireland as a whole. So I think nursing is valued and as the most trusted profession, I think it's well placed that we, we do value the work that they do. And, and I certainly do value um, the contribution of all, of all the health and social care services. In relation to um, acceleration of pay progression, uh, nursing has been within the Agenda for Change framework uh, since it began in 2004. Many of our nurses are sitting in, on band five uh, salaries, um, have been for quite some time. And the Agenda for Change framework, in my opinion, hasn't really um, done any favours to nursing as, as a profession. And I think as roles expand and as nurses take on new and... Sorry, just Charlotte, we've lost you there momentarily. Yeah. Charlotte, we're not hearing you just for a second there. Okay. I think we need to suspend the session again. Fine. There are to that. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed. This is the Northern we're, we're now back in public session, so if you could pick up again, Charlotte, from that point of agenda for change. Okay, so um, um, I think where we dropped off was that agenda for change um, really didn't uh, serve nursing well in terms of uh, career development opportunities um, as, as a pay structure. And uh, there are many, uh, most of the, of our, more than half of, of the nursing workforce are, are band five uh, nurses. And the, the feedback that we got from the nursing and midwifery task group um, co-production in engagement sessions with nurses and midwives, of which over a thousand of them inputted, was that they wanted um, us to take forward work that would look at rectifying that position. Um, I think the RCN and the other trade unions have a key role to play here in pay negotiations and, and, and working with government around uh, how we recognise and, and reward um, nurses and midwives in particular uh, going forward. But in relation to the accelerated pay, the recommendation was that, that uh, there would be a run through, if you like, from band five to six to recognise the expertise and the experience and the fact that many band five nurses are in charge of wards and departments, which was re never really intended to be the case because uh, it's an entry grade to professional practice. And for many other professions, there is a run through, uh, midwifery being one, um, social work being another, with specific requirements around that. So um, the, the minister was unable to accept that recommendation at the moment because he asked uh, for more work to be done in making the case and outlining the benefits of that. Uh, uh, and the department has committed to do that. However, that has had to be paused due to COVID, uh, but we will pick that up uh, once we, we get our services uh, restarted uh, as time allows going forward. Sure. Chair, can I just come back on that? Yes, Pam, go ahead. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that, Charlotte. Um, I, I am still very, very concerned, and I should have declared, um, Chair, at the start, an interest that um, I do have a family member who is um, um, who has worked in Nightingale, and could well be back there again in the near future. And I just think it's like it's it's wonderful that we that we clap for people like um, ICU nurses, but I think it it is pretty insulting if we don't pay them what they're worth. And you know, if an ICU nurse is a band six, isn't that right? Some are band uh, some are band five and some are band six. And those who are band six uh, are, are band six because they've taken on additional roles. Um, band five nurses, ICU nurses generally are, are banded band five, the same as the same as other um, areas. And in some places, 
they have been uplifted to band six because they've taken on a team leader role or they've taken on a particular area of practice within the unit that's allowed them to do so. But it is one area that we will consider in terms of the, that accelerated pay progression. But in reality, there are, there are band five nurses who are working in ICUs and putting themselves and their families at the absolute most risk in terms of COVID-19 that um, are not and have not been receiving um, a band six um, appropriate pay level that you'd expect to receive um, in working in that type of environment? Well, I think it's wider than ICU, to be honest. I think there are many nurses working in very complex situations in many departments and in communities uh, right across Northern Ireland, and that we need to consider all of that in, in the round. So did you say that half of our nurses are band five? Yes, more than slightly more than half. So is that the real issue, the fact that more than half of the nurses are band five and the, that is the worry that it would simply cost too much to pay them band six? Well, I don't think it's it's actually a costing issue, although you'll appreciate with nursing and midwifery being the biggest workforce, 35% of the overall, any change to the terms and conditions is significant cost. But I think it's more about demonstrating um, the outcomes and how it will improve care for people uh, going forward and really demonstrating and valuing the contribution that nursing and midwifery can make to make that argument to ensure there is a clear career pathway. For me, it's actually about keeping nurses in practice and allowing them to stay in their area and develop their expertise at a higher level. And part of the problem with the career structure within nursing is, and has been for many, many years, uh, you know, once you get to the band seven level, which is like a ward sister or team leader role, after that, there really isn't much more for you to do in clinical practice. And many nurses move into that management roles, myself included. Um, and I'd like to try and reverse that uh, with the development of very good clinical career pathways. That work has begun with the Northern Ireland Practice and Education Council, and we're working our way through each specific uh, pathway of care. And you'll be aware of the developments around advanced nursing practice, uh, which are higher level posts, which enable nurses to stay in clinical practice and really work at the top end of their life. So I'm very keen to promote that as the way forward across mental health, learning disability, adults and, and children. Okay. When expecting the review to be completed then? The review of? The um, the review to establish the evidence of cost and benefits of the full um, of the recommendation. And the Minister has requested that that would be completed within the next uh, 18 months. Okay. Okay, I'm going to stay on the phones and I'm going then to Pat. Are you there, Pat? And do you have a question for Charlotte in this section? Yeah, go ahead, Pat. Okay, we've lost you there, Pat. If you can just pause for a second to see if you get back on back online. Okay, I'm going to have to pause the session again and wait. Um, we're having a lot of technical trouble here this morning now. Um, yes, I'm going to pause the session so you can get this resolved. Is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed? This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland. Pat, go ahead with your question, please. Thank you. Um, thanks, uh, Charlotte. Uh, uh, thanks for coming in this morning. I want to ask you about the the issues surrounding the fit testing certificates. And we know that up to 3,000 staff have been identified as requiring a retest. And I'm wondering, do you have the overall figures for the number of staff who have been identified as requiring a retest who have contracted COVID-19?
We're going to have to pause and suspend again. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. You were just about to... Yeah, okay. go ahead, Charlotte, please, with your answer to Pat. Um, so I, I was just um, explaining that I don't have that information um, in front of me, but um, I do know that those staff who required uh, new fit testing uh, is all but um, complete uh, in most circumstances and that the numbers uh, across organisations did vary. Um, I think with most uh, staff, the biggest numbers of staff needing uh, fit testing were in the Belfast Trust and the South Eastern Trust. And then in terms of a direct correlation with uh, COVID positive, um, I think the only trust that has identified COVID positive um, members of staff that I'm aware of is, is the South Eastern Trust. And I think they had between 10 and 15 who tested positively. Uh, but it's unclear whether there's a direct correlation between the fit test and, and the uh, COVID positive test, uh, if you like. So I think we would have to be um, aware that there is a possibility that that did happen. And I know that the South Eastern Trust have put all support uh, in, in place for the staff that, that were affected. Uh, and just to follow up on that, Chair, if that's OK. Go ahead, Pat, yeah. Um, the, the, the Minister has said that the risk to staff was low. Can you explain how that assessment was arrived at? Thanks. Um, the, the, the risk to staff was low because um, the, the, fit te the mask uh, provided some coverage. It just didn't provide a, a, a tight seal. And it's my understanding, and this is a complicated process, that there are various steps in the process of fit testing up to, I think, seven steps, and um, the majority of staff would have passed elements of the seven, but not all seven steps, which meant that they did have some protection from the mask, but not just full protection. Um, and that is why that we established that the risk was low. OK. Thank you. OK, then, going then to Orlea on the phone. Orlea, are you there? And, and do you have a question? Yes, um, I'm here, Chair. Thank you. Um, and thanks, Charlotte. I just wanted to touch on um, so the, the overall rebuilding plan. I know the Chair had, had touched on it in his questions earlier in the session. Um, but in relation to your input as, as CNO, um, I just wonder, Charlotte, would you have any, you know, like um, uh, any examples of submissions that you have made um, as CNO to that overall plan? And I know that the chair had also raised the issue around the allied health professionals and sort of their voice and their input. And I'm just wondering on that issue, um, given that the, the schools are reopening and obviously the allied health prof professionals have a key role um, for children with speech and language um, and communication needs. So I was wondering if you could advise on how the speech and language therapists and indeed all the allied health professionals will be supported to carry out um, these really important roles um, with with those children within the education system in the time ahead. Thank you. Um, thanks, Orlea, for that. Um, firstly, in relation to the management board, obviously I, I'm a member as a CNO and I'm actually leading two of the prioritised work streams. So. Uh, the ones that I'm leading are in relation to surge planning for phase two and then the acute care at home and the, the initiative around the developing the new framework. So I've, I've produced papers to the management executive on both of those 
in terms of the project initiation documents and the plans going forward, which have been signed off by the management board. Okay. Um, and I would also say that um, allied health professionals are working very closely with the chief allied health professional officer in both of those because of the vital role that allied health professionals will play in surge planning uh, for, for a further phase, particularly uh, in recovery um, and in the reorganisation um, of the service and having allied health professional staff, as they did in the first wave, move into different roles to support the care of, of people. Um, so we're working very closely closely on that and, and the Chief Allied Health Professional Officer is a member of the project board for, sur for surge planning and will be for the, the new health framework. So she's um, very much integrated into and has gr uh, very good opportunities to um, discuss those issues with me. In relation then to special schools, um, obviously uh, the Chief Allied Health Professional Officer takes a, a key uh, role in, in this and working with uh, colleagues and policy side here of disability and also there's a specific Allied Health Professional post in place now at the PHA and that uh, is a very close working relationship to ensure that the um, Allied Health Professional support required to special schools is available. So again, um, I would work very closely with the Chief Allied Health Professional Officer to ensure that the necessary resources uh, are in place in line with the available budget. Mm -hmm. So um, I can't I can't overemphasize that uh, the Chief Allied Health Professional and I work very closely t together and will be in daily contact on these issues. Okay, thank you, Charlotte. And could I just ask a second question, Chair? Yes, go ahead, Orlea. Thank you. Um, and it's just, uh, again, to bring it back to the um, Rapid Learning Initiative. Um, and I'm not sure if you'll you'll have an answer to this question, um, Charlotte, but I was just wondering, do you know who um, drafted the terms of reference um, for that Rapid Learning Initiative? And I know that it was, um, it was uh, due to report um, on the 19th of July, which would have been last Friday. So I'm just wondering if you would have a copy of that report and if you would be able to maybe share it with the committee um, if you did have a copy of it at this stage. Thank you. So um, the draft terms of reference were drafted by the Deputy Chief Nursing Officer uh, who's taken the lead in, in carrying forward that work and uh, the report is currently being prepared and uh, well, there will be a sign-off meeting I think on the 29th of July and once the Minister's had the opportunity to review that and um, clear it, I'm very happy to share that with the committee. Brilliant, thank you. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you, Orlea. I'm going now across to Jerry. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Charlotte, for your presentation. Um, I, I've been contacted. I'm sure there's have been about uh, concerns about malnutrition uh, amongst older people. Um, the Dietitians Association have been in touch, and I was shocked to learn that uh, before COVID, one in ten over 65s were at risk of malnutrition, um, and that's obviously likely to increase uh, in this period. Um, and that obviously, you know, the fact that it's, you know, it's a scandal and a crisis in and of itself, but there's obviously um, associated health risks with that, muscle wasting, cognitive impairment and so on. Um, so, so what commitment, uh, Charlotte, is there to tackle food uh, insecurity? Um, and just two quick points uh, on top of that. Um, there are concerns, as the Chair raised, about the new management board, uh, that there is no specific voice for uh, AHPs and it's no... Uh, disrespect to yourself, Charlotte, but people feel that it's a bit of a closed shop, um, and we're seeing, you know, um, documents being um, released in the press about um, the reduction of emergency departments, and there's a real question about transparency uh, and the nature of that board uh, itself. Um, so, a comment on that, and just finally, I think it is important that nurses um, are paid uh, properly, uh, adequately, um, uh, generally, but also. That they're paid the strike pay that was promised to them, and you know we all clap for them uh, on Thursday. Ministers clap for them, but it's no good. Ministers clapping for them and not paying them what they've promised and, and what they're owed. So, do you think it's long overdue uh, that those nurses, as chief and nursing officer, are paid the strike pay uh, that they lost out because they were forced to take strike action uh, earlier this year? Um, thank you. So there are a number of uh, questions there. So uh, if I understand you right, the first question was in relation to um, nutrition and the, the commitment to food. Um, Jerry, is that correct? Malnutrition, yeah. So um, obviously dietitians have a key role to play in, in uh, supporting people with very complex nutritional needs. Uh, however, there's a responsibility in all healthcare staff and, and social care staff to 
uh, ensure that uh, patients and residents received, uh, receive adequate nutrition. And um, I am responsible for the nutrition strategy. Uh, and I have a group set up of GEN, which the Chief Allied Health Professional Officer is part of. And there's dietetic input to that. And each uh, trust then has a management group chaired by the, the um, Director of Nursing. Again, because of the link between allied health professionals and nursing uh, to oversee um, nutritional management in, in the organisation, both in hospital and community. And some years ago, work was done on um, identification of people at risk and uh, support plans put in place. Um, it's very much in the domain of nursing to assess those needs, both in hospital and community, and to put in place uh, strategies and care plans to support people with poor nutritional needs, and then to refer on to dietitians for specific input where required. Obviously, in areas like intensive care, where many uh, patients are receiving tube feeds, uh, dietitians have a very key role to play in supporting, supporting that, and the same with people with intestinal problems, again, which need specific input and calorific input as well as vitamins and nutrition uh, from our dietetic teams. So there is a clear commitment um, to ensure that the nutrition of, of the population of Northern Ireland, both in terms of healthy eating, uh, weight management, and also at the other end of the scale where people are poorly nourished, that we address and identify those issues uh, early on. Um, in relation then to um, the second point, which was the transparency of the management board, um, I hope through my evidence here today, you can see the strong uh, working relationship that I have with the Chief Allied Health Professional Officer. And in fact, um, you know, she is key to the decision making within my team and as a senior member of my team and uh, is well linked into the management board, although she may not be there in person. And I, I've already given a commitment as has the minister that if specific input is required, um, that, will be, that will be taken forward. Can I just check the committee can still hear me? Yes, we're hearing you. Yep. <laughs> Good. Um, uh, and um, I think as the work develops um, in the in the management board, uh, the outworkings of that will become clear to, to, to the system. Um, as I've said, the papers which I've brought forward, Jenny will have the chief professional officer for AHPs will have input to and is part of the structure that supports the development of those um, project initiate, initiation documents. And then the third point was in relation to pay. And as I've already said, um, the, the minister's outlined his commitment to ensure that that happens as quickly as possible, and therefore that will happen in, in due course, um, as soon as it can be made available through his um, finance colleagues. Uh, I understand conversations are still happening at executive table about how that will happen. Okay. Thank you. Colin. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, thank you. Um, Charlotte, uh, the question really is about um, many of the nursing professional staff that were re relocated to various um, centres during the, the, the response. So, for example, many staff from the Down Hospital were relocated to work in the Lagan Valley and Ulster Hospital. Um, initial ripples, are, I, I'm not sure if you were aware, uh, included them uh, having parts of their pay cut because they uh, were taking travel time to get from one place to another um, when they arrived in their new locations of work because the surge that was predicted didn't arrive. Many of them were left with no work to do. Uh, some were encouraged to take annual leave. Um, many of the services haven't been returned back to their original um, uh, places of work. Many of the services that were cancelled haven't been restarted. And we did have um, the chief executives on earlier, um, one of whom mentioned on at least two, if not three occasions, about the images on television in Italy and other places that meant that they ha you, everybody had to prepare their responses. But it did become very obvious quite quickly that that wasn't what we were going to face here. Um, are, are you concerned that many of the nursing professions professionals are, are having their working arrangements completely up the left and that there's not much help or assistance to relocate them back to their original places of work? Um, well, the first thing I would say, there's many, many nurses, uh, we're talking nurses, but it's midwives and, and allied health professionals as well, because everybody has changed how they work um, for the benefit of, of patient care and willingly and uh, moved locations where they had to. And where we saw the biggest, I think, impact of that were, was nurses moving into ICU to support teams there. 
and and you're right through the through the the, the good work of, of our of our health and social care teams and um the obeyance of the public to the required rules in relation to social distancing hand hygiene uh, good respiratory etiquette etc we didn't see what could have been uh, an even worse um covid pa pandemic with many more lives lost so uh, we prepared for the worst and uh, if we didn't prepare for the worst, I think, you know, I might have been at the committee justifying why we hadn't prepared for the worst. So it's a fine balance uh, to strike. Um, so many people did move willingly. I'm not aware of the particular issues that you refer to uh, between uh, the Down and, and Lagan Valley. Uh, and, and I don't really understand why people would have their, their pay cut. So I can't uh, personally comment on that. I'm not aware of issues about nurses um, not being settled back into their original place of work. And I think it's crucial that that happens because we won't be able to rebuild uh, our services without having uh, people back. So one of the examples is, is health visiting. A number of health visiting uh, staff were moved um, out of health visiting into other acute roles, but we cannot have a situation where children are not having their health checks and that that's not happening on time. Many of our school nursing staff will need to be involved in the immunization program going forward. So it's important that they are back at their workplace um, planning for how they will take forward the immunization of children, both for flu and for COVID whenever the vaccine becomes available. So it's critically important that we have the staff in the right place doing the right job in order to rebuild our services going forward. And, and I'm not aware of any particular issues that, that you raised. Just in a, in a politely challenging way, um, you, you built up there that you would have to come to the committee to defend not doing something, and I never suggested that you weren't doing it. Of course, I actually said we needed to prepare for the worst at the beginning. That's what we had to do. But it became apparent very quickly, um, probably possibly after about a month to six weeks into the uh, into it, that we weren't going to be seeing the 15,000 deaths and the Nightingale Hospital wasn't going to be required. And really, to me, it would have been at that stage, whenever you were starting to suggest that you didn't need the likes of the Nightingale, Nightingale that whenever you knew that there were floor upon floor upon floor in the city hospital that was then not going to be required to be used, to me, the trusts at that point should have been then starting to flush their staff back out into their original posts and their original jobs. And maybe then at that stage, we maybe wouldn't see the backlog that we're looking at now. But if I'm picking you up correctly, do the trusts not engage with you then if they're reshaping their services and they're moving nursing staff about the place? You're the chief nursing officer, aren't you? Would that not be something that the trusts would discuss with you if, if dozens and dozens, if not hundreds of nursing staff are having their, their working locations and their working jobs changed? Absolutely. I mean, during the whole pandemic, I had uh, three times a week calls with the directors of nursing, Monday, Wednesday and Friday, where we addressed many of those issues that you're referring to, as well as many others. What I'm saying to you is that issues, that, as you're describing them, weren't brought to me by the directors of nursing. So I'm assuming that in the main, uh, those things, while I accept there would have been teething problems at the start, um, have returned to normal um, because I'm not hearing from any other source, either the RCN, which would often be a, a source of letting me know uh, when things are not good, uh, and nurses are, are feeling um, unsupported, and the directors of nursing and my visits out to uh, wards and department and my close contacts with the service. None of those um, avenues have raised the issue with me that you've raised today. But I will undertake to investigate that. Um, and and the unions haven't approached you about this at all? No, no, they haven't. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Colin. And going now to Paula. Um, thank you. And such a long session for you, Charlotte. My, my question is in relation to your role as chair of the Department of Health Steering, Steering Group on the new cancer strategy. And I'm just wondering what work um, was carried out, if any, during the height of the pandemic and how you're picking up the pace to sort of try to meet targets and, and move that work forward. Obviously, it's even more valuable because we've, we've had a drop in diagnostics, etc. Um, we, we had a very successful um, engagement, um, I think back in January, not long after the assembly was re-established. Um, and then we stood things down from uh, COVID uh, from March to, to June. With that has restarted now. We've had our first project board meeting um, in June and recognition from project board members that uh, 
the work that we were planning to do in the cancer strategy and there's a significant amount of work has already been done and actually the development of the strategy was going uh, extremely well uh, we, and we have very good engagement and uh, it has been co-produced uh, from the very start. Um, that the, the, the project steering board wanted to take stock because uh, it recognised that the starting place for cancer services now is different than it was whenever we started the work over a year ago and that we will have to consider and take account of COVID um, in the, the cancer strategy. So um, actually yesterday at the, the, the management board, we had a long discussion uh, about cancer services and about uh, restarting those, those services and a recognition that the cancer strategy obviously is a longer term, uh, a longer term development in cancer services to take us through the next 10 years. And it is crucially dependent on workforce issues and uh, networks and um, how we how we re-stabilise cancer services post-COVID. And I think that our attention now is on rebuilding cancer cancer services. Uh, it will it will be very slow and it will not get back to uh, the way it was even pre-COVID very quickly. But there's an absolute um, ambition to to make sure that cancer patients get the right treatment um, as fast as possible. And that then will uh, we will take that time while services are being rebuilt, bearing in mind that many of our our groups um, and the work streams and the steering group, uh, which is co-chaired by a person with lived experience of cancer, have had to shield during this period, and access to them has also been uh, very limited. But we will pick it up now. But I would say that it's, un it's unlikely it kicked us off our timeline, if you like. Uh, significantly and we will have to reassess all of that but our primary focus at this stage is to rebuild cancer services. Thank you. I actually um, attended that um, event in January and I think it was an excellent example of co-production because the room was buzzing and full of people. They're all very very enthused so thank you for that. My question, uh, second question is really around safe staffing legislation and really about how that's moving forward and whether or not you think that allied health professionals should be included in coverage in such legislation. Thank you. Um, yeah, so um, as part of the framework agreement with the uh, industrial action, um, the minister agreed that uh, we would take forward work on uh, safe, safe staffing legislation. And uh, looking around the world, there aren't many examples of where governments have put uh, safe staffing uh, into legislation. Um, closer to home, obviously, Wales and Scotland uh, are, are in the pro well, Wales have it in, and, and Scotland are in the process of, of doing that, and they've taken different approaches to this. Um, in Wales, it's, it's nurse staffing, and in Scotland, they've gone for a much broader approach to include all healthcare um, professionals. And I think that that uh, is the way in which um, we will consider this going forward, is to look broader than, than nursing. However, um, given the issues with the nursing workforce um, and the fact that we have a very good policy on safe staffing called delivering care, which has been in place since 2014, I think nursing is probably a little bit better placed to uh, be the first phase of the legislation, but I would absolutely agree that it needs to be wider than and should include AHPs. Thank you. Thank you. And just by way of a follow-up to that, Charlotte, uh, that question to Paul is, in 2016, the department undertook to recruit 622 international nurses. How many have been recruited to date and what issues are affecting that recruitment? Um, I don't have the the exact uh, figure column. I'm very happy to, to get it. Um, it's been obviously paused during the COVID um, pandemic for a lot of reasons. One, travel, travel uh, ability of people to travel from their home countries. Two, the fact that the Nursing and Midwifery Council stood down the processes that we had in place that would allow overseas nurses to register. Um, and and three. Obviously, um, our attention was on uh, making sure that we could manage the, the, the COVID um, situation. So uh, I, I think we're pretty close to where we wanted to be, uh, although it has taken a bit longer in terms of the process. But uh, to date, I think we have around 600 nurses um, in, in, in already recruited. Um, and there has been a slight delay and the programme has extended because, because of COVID. Um, and I think that uh, if I could just share with you the numbers from the, the recent NMC um, report that they just issued in July shows that the increase of registrants in Northern Ireland, I think, was about 2.7%. And there was a direct correlation between that 2.7% and the number of overseas nurses that had registered 
in Northern Ireland. So I think while it has been a bit slow to get off the ground, we've made very good progress and I must pay tribute to the Health and Social Care Trust and to the uh, Clinical Education Centre and CEC and the Ulster University who provide the, the OSCE assessment because we've had a very significant, um, I think, positive outcome where almost 100% of all overseas nurses get through that OSCE process first time. And that is unique uh, to Northern Ireland compared with the rest of the UK. Um, so we're on target. We will get there. It's just taken a little bit longer. OK, thank you. And going across then to Alan for a question. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, Charlotte, just uh, uh, I want to make a few comments and ask a few questions around childcare. Um, could I ask you if the temporary childcare facilities made available by the Minister for Education uh, over sort of past weeks uh, did that go some way uh, to mitigating uh, concerns uh, uh, with the nursing staff around childcare and? Are there any concerns um, going forward uh, about childcare uh, in terms of the, the part-time, the proposed part-time and phased reopening of schools in, in August and September? Um, will that, in fact, uh, maybe exacerbate uh, the childcare re requirements, uh, given that it, 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 it is going to be a part-time situation? And also, will you be encouraging trusts to be flexible uh, in relation to shift allocations uh, to ease uh, childcare concerns of, of individual nursing staff going forward? Thank you. Um, thank you. So, um, interestingly, I actually was on a Zoom call yesterday with a number of um, young nurse leaders, and um, we were taking the learning from uh, COVID. And one of the things that they said to me was that childcare was really important for them in order to uh, make sure that it could, could be available for work when they, when they needed to. So it's one of the top priorities, particularly for uh, people, obviously, with young families and, and uh, younger, younger nurses and, and midwives. Um, and I suppose during the pandemic, they haven't had the opportunity to uh, have grandparents uh, cover that uh, for them, which they might have done in the past. Many of them said that their, their spouses and their partners were either furloughed or uh, working from home, which was a, a huge help. But given that they were working extra shifts uh, and longer shifts, the childcare facilities that were put in place did help a number of people, particularly uh, single mums um, or those with a lot of young ch children. So I do agree that that was a helpful initiative. I don't think the uptake has been as high as we uh, had anticipated it would be, but I think that was because Many, many people, as I've said, had partners that were furloughed or, or able to work from, from home. And I think in terms of uh, moving forward and flexible uh, work allocation has always been, I suppose, the bedrock of, of, uh, of nursing to accommodate people's needs and to try and be flexible with shifts. And I would absolutely encourage that to continue, particularly when we have some uh, remaining challenges in, in the workforce and, and uh, we want to keep the very good staff that we have and the expertise that they bring. And if that means being a bit more flexible in terms of their working life and their shift patterns, I would absolutely support that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you for that. There's another couple of questions I had, some of which are maybe short enough and some of which you might not be able to answer. And I appreciate you, you staying on today. And I know you need a way for half one, Charlotte. But just could I ask, the Rapid Learning Initiative, did that consider the discharge policy in relation to admitting patients into care homes without testing? Um, is that part of the rapid learning initiative that you're doing? Yes, uh, testing in its widest guise is part of, of that initiative. And so that will consider obviously discharge as well. Okay. Another quick question I have is in relation, has there been any attempts to develop a COVID-19 life assurance scheme? And we had heard in the early stages of, of the surge that, that there was issues with that. Has there been any work done on that? And how are you engaging with unions or workforce on, on relation to that? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to pass on that one. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I, I don't have enough information to make any kind of informed uh, response to that, um, Chair, but I'll certainly uh, undertake to find out for you. Yeah. And, yeah, thank you, Charlotte. And the final one for me is in relation to agency staff, which we all know has been a perennial problem. Has there been any um, 
And, and there has been reports that a lot of agency work has dried up over the surge with people re being relocated and, and all of that, and the terms and conditions of agency staff. Has there been any success in terms of bringing agency staff back in fully within house, or are there any plans to try to address that issue uh, more proactively coming out of COVID, this spike of COVID? Um, well, actually, there was a, a very good uh, proposal being developed uh, in consultation and co-produced by the trade unions pre-COVID, uh, and it was very near um, conclusion, uh, led by my, poli my colleagues in policy area of workforce policy. Um, that will be recommenced now that we're through the uh, initial surge of COVID, as, as again, as time allows, because we don't, we don't know uh, what, what the autumn and winter will bring, and we have to prepare for that too. So it's very much back on the agenda, and the idea of that would be um, that we try and attract people into full-time uh, positions in trusts and enhance uh, th their their payments through bank um, and, and encourage the agency staff to go back into the work environment. I, I, and I don't I don't think it's all it's all just about the enhancements in the pay. I, I think it's about the experience of of uh, work life balance and feeling valued and and making a contribution to the workplace. And uh, one of the biggest um, improvements in that area will be the increased availability of the nursing workforce. Um, as we go forward. So we're beginning to see a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel in terms of the workforce challenges with, as I say, um, increased um, registrations at the NMC 2.7% and the huge uh, improvement, 87% increase from 2016 to now in undergraduate places. So it's starting to trickle out and I'm very hopeful that in the next couple of years, we will see those workforce issues reverse and in doing so make uh, working life of nurses um, much more attractive and uh, help to retain the staff that we have. Okay. Thank you um, and, and thank you Charlotte for your presentation and your, and your answers and your commitment to providing those other bits and pieces of information to the committee. Can I on behalf of the committee thank you for the work that you have done and continue to do and also those people who you lead in terms of the nursing workforce and our ongoing appreciation and gratitude for what they have done at this time and what they will likely have to do in the future as well. So thank you for that. We appreciate it and all the best. Slan Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, members, I now suggest that we will take a break there. Could we maybe reconvene again at 2.15? And uh, we may, yeah, so we'll suspend the session and come back again at 2.15. Thank you. The Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern